and uh, greeting from got the recording greeting from uh, egypt uh, uh, my name is uh, Prof. Emmanuel Sharif. I am the Pan African University Vice President of the Council of the University. And welcome to the World Conference on Education and Restitution. Re uh, the theme of this uh, session is uh, the past, present, and future Afro futurism and Africa's development. Uh, actually, uh, it's my honor uh, to be uh, among this. Uh, diverse, uh, eminent uh, African experts, and it's been a pleasure to, to be invited here. And the, the conference is uh, an initiative between the Association of African Universities, the Pan African Heritage World Museum, UNESCO, and under the auspices of the government of Ghana and the African Union Commission. Uh, all of them are organizing this special diaspora uh, conference. In uh, this conference, we have also the honor of other collaborators like the Ban East Ghan National House of Chiefs, Ghana Cultural Forum, uh, Diaspora African Forum, African Private Sector, and the Global Institute of Planning and Sustainable Development, and all African student unions, and me from the Ban African University. So welcome aboard, all of you. This is Amanya Sharif, Professor of Microbiology and Immunology, Dean Faculty of Pharmacy and other University, Regional uh, Coordinator for uh, Association of African University, and recently elected as the Pan African University Vice President. It's my pleasure to be here and be part of this great event that brings together all African diaspora with the African academics to discuss critical issues of the future of Africa, higher education, and as we all know, that uh, higher education is the driving force for all developed uh, countries and uh, nations. Uh, the main objective of this event is to reclaim the reconstitution, uh, the, the African education, uh, education including technology, politics, language, history, art, culture, music, spiritually towards a conscious effort of uh, unification and rapid development of Africa. And for sure, this can't be done without combination of efforts of all Africans in order to build and the glory of our beloved shiny young continent by its own uh, sons and daughters. One of the most critical solution to unify Africa is the African continental free trade area. This is very sensitive and important issue. And I'm sure all of you agree with me that we would like to know more about it. So let's uh, let's start our session entitled uh, Addressing the Prerequisites for the Implementation of African Continental Free Trade Area. The session will address the following topics connecting Africa people, infrastructure and the traffic policies, rules, uh, process, procedure for harmonizing trade governance and interdependency and uh, complementary between African uh, economics and the question of African common uh, uh, currencies and developing continental legal resources and uh, fair uh, arbitration. To know more about this important and safe and uh, updated topic, let's welcome our first distinguished speaker, Dr. Francis Mangini. Dr. Uh, Francis has worked and consulted extensively on the multilateral trade system and African economic integration and has been senior fellow with the Nelson Mandela School of Public Governance at the University of Cape Town, head of programs with the African Continental Free Trade Area and director of uh, trade customer and monetary affairs with the common market for Eastern and Southern Africa. Also was advisor uh, to the Minister of Commerce and Industry of the government of Malawi, the senior economist at the uh, permanent delegation of African Union to the United Nations, WOW, and other international organizations based at Geneva, Switzerland, and was the regional trade policy advisor at the Commission 
of the African Union. Actually, I honor to read your bio, uh, Dr. Francis, and the floor is yours, and uh, we all ears to listen to you. Dr. Francis, are you on board? The IT, can you support maybe she can unmute herself? Hello, Prof. Yes. Yeah, thank you very much for your opening remarks and would want to entreat um, everyone joining wherever you are that we have started. Uh, Prof. Amani just made her first opening remarks. So Prof, um, uh, do I have your permission to introduce uh, our next speaker on the next topic? Uh, so, uh, Dr. Francis is not available. Okay. Okay, I, can I uh, introduce the second speaker? Lindsay? Yes, please, you go ahead. Okay. Yeah, you can go ahead. So let's till we connect it to Francis. Let's uh, welcome uh, Mrs. Lindsay Hurlfield. Uh, she uh, she's the multilingual lawyer. Wow, who has demonstrated the ability to work across multiple uh, 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 jurisdictions. Jurid I don't know what is the word, but she has extensive experience. It, it says the host is not allowing participants to unmute themselves. Yes, this is what I'm asking about. Can you allow uh, the speakers to mute themselves? Because maybe this is a problem. Okay. Please check, check with me, Chef. Uh, so um, a quick one to the call team to ensure that um, all the main speakers have the co-host rights okay. to be able to present. Okay, for saving the time, I will uh, continue the introduction of uh, Mrs. Lindsay. Okay, she uh, she has extensive experience in technology and the commercial, inclusive and the intellectual property uh, law, and uh, capable of working very well in both uh, a team and the autonomous setting. Further, thrive under rigorous environment with the ability to adhere to deadline with uh, outmost contents. She will uh, spoke to us about it, uh, the technology regulations and its impact within the AFC uh, FTA. Uh, if you are there, Lindsay, please unmute yourself and join us. And until we have uh, we have uh, Lindsay or one of the speakers, let's uh, talk to you more about this important conference actually this is a joint conference it will start or already started from today 30 of august 2022 and it will continue till the first of september and the conference aimed to reclaim and recontextualize con, uh, African education, technology, politics, language, histories, art, culture, music, and spirituality towards a conscious effort of uh, unification and rapid development of Africa. The reappreciation of African heritage of education is the uh, key to telling and retelling the Africans' own stories to disrupt the master uh, inaccurate uh, narratives as handed down mainly from global northern uh, perspectives. Actually, my team asked me to, uh, to check the chat box. So uh, I am and I able, Lindsay is here and she's not able to mute herself. Oh, I'm here now. I could, I could do it now. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Welcome. morning. Welcome. Um, Welcome. Pleasure to meet you guys. So, um, okay. Thank you. All right. So I guess I'll start. Um, yeah, I'm not sure um, with regard to the bio, so which is completely fine, but just to kind of give you a little bit of idea of myself. So I'm currently based here in the US, but I um, been, I'm a lawyer based in Australia, actually. So my background is focusing on um, international technology, intellectual property, as well as um, data privacy. So I do focus, um, I do focus on tech startups, um, as well as the um, privacy hubs um, globally. So just to kind of get sorted, what I'm going to do, I'm actually going to share my screen because I do have a PowerPoint there. So just bear with me one second. To apologize. All right, so bear with me a moment. 
Apologies. Okay, so all right. I'm not sure. Are you guys able to see my screen or no? Are you guys able to see my screen? Not yet. Okay. Just bear with me. I'm not sure what's going on. Okay, so it's not while we go through. So which is fine. What I'm gonna do is obviously be adaptable <laughs> and have to be agile. So just bear with me one second. So essentially, what my focus on in relation to the um African Continental Free Trade Agreement is really focusing on phase three of negotiation, which is actually the protocol on digital trade. So to kind of give you a little bit of an overview, um, essentially with regard to the African, with the African Continental Free Trade Agreement, the, it obviously commenced in terms of trade on the 1st of January, 2021. Uh, with regard to that, of course, that serves as a catalyst that we all know towards integration of the African market and particularly across all sectors. Um, with regard to that, of course, with the African Continental Free Trade Agreement being the largest free trade area, we currently have 54 countries that are signed on um, as of June 2022. Um, the only exception that we do not have at the moment is Eritrea. And of course, we do have that ambitious plan with regard to having a significant increase um, within that intra-African trade by over 50% and a combined GDP of over 3.4 trillion in terms of US dollars. So of course, that's... Um, quite essential in terms of what does that mean for the population with over 1.2 billion people um, in Africa. So what I've done is essentially, again, as mentioned, really focusing on phase three of negotiations. So just to be mindful, it actually hasn't commenced just yet. Uh, the African continent free trade agreement has actually completed for the phase one, which is um, trade and services. It's underway of actually concluding phase two, which is intellectual property services, as well as um, as well as investments um, as well. So essentially, it's scheduled to I hopefully I guess to commence negotiation as of early next year. I think phase two is meant to be completed the end of this year. So with regard to phase three of the um, of the negotiation, it really deals with four main components. So we're really looking at, for instance, um, market access. So really, what does it mean in terms of e-commerce being able to, or at least people having access across the continent? Facilitation, so really the ease of how, um, the ease of how technology will be utilized, what infrastructure will be in place with regard to that. Uh, rules and regulation, that's also very important. I think that's really, that's really the main important part that I'm going to actually be focusing on for, in the interest of time. So really looking at what are consumer protections that are actually in place, intellectual properties, um, as well as data protections. And of course, last but not least, enabling issues. So really what infrastructures are currently in place to ensure that networks are able to be utilized much more swiftly, um, that is more affordable, but also to that there is a, a benchmark when in relation to actual technical, like technology infrastructures in, in place. Uh, so as mentioned, in the interest of time, I am going to be focusing on the rules and regulations. So really more so the data privacy component. So just so you know that with e-commerce, it has definitely proven to be much more vital since the pandemic. That increase of reliance within um, technology, um, more cross-border trades, more of that, more of that um, technology facilitation has been very, very important. So one of the things I wanted to also look at as well is how do we look at e-commerce from the lens of Africa? So not just from what we see on that that um, from the West, but really what is Africans, what is Africa's lens in relation to e-commerce? So what I started looking at is the challenges of data privacy overall. So as we know, we have the few legal instruments with regard to the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. Uh, the issue with that, though, is that the data privacy protection provisions are not enacted within these instruments. So it actually, these instruments, so you have both the um, Malibu Convention, which I'm going to speak about a little bit, as well as um, the protocols. So essentially, the issue is that, the issue with these is that it essentially allows states 
to handle data privacy um, protection in terms of, look, We'll, 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 we'll give you the floor to do it, but there is an actual guideline or, or any form of uniform process in place, which could be quite problematic, especially when dealing with data privacy that is very new. Uh, there are no regional body that really oversees technology regulations. And of course, there, are, there is a lack of funding and resources that's dedicated to creating government agencies that's dedicated to implementing these data privacy regulations. So two examples that I brought up in terms of um, the legal instruments, one is the African Union Convention on Cybersecurity and Personal Data Protection, in other words, the Malibu Convention. Uh, so Article 8, which is the personal data protection, really talks about how each state shall establish a legal framework aimed at strengthening fundamental rights, particularly around protection of physical data. It also says the same thing under Article 24, which is the National Cybersecurity Framework, in which essentially that each state party shall undertake to develop a national cybersecurity policy, which recognize the importance of critical information infrastructure. So now we also have the agreement established, so the agreement establishing the African continental free trade area, and particularly the, pro the protocol of trade and services. So we have Article 15C2, which essentially says these are the general exceptions. What it says is that um, nothing in the protocol should be construed to prevent the adoption and enforcement by any states of measures. So really that member states are to essentially ensure that the provision that they have domestically is in compliance with the protocol of trades and services. However, and that also includes data privacy um, or protection of data privacy, I should say. The issue is, as mentioned, is that there isn't an actual regulatory framework or any form of guidelines to really provide a benchmark that, the, that these member states could actually follow. So what I've done, I've actually looked at two, um, two different countries in terms of a, a quick case study. One was Ghana. Uh, they had enacted the, the Data Protection Act in 2012. Whilst, yes, that's great, what I've actually focused more so on are actual frameworks outside the Data Protection Act. So one is a regulator that's actually looking to possibly implement the data protection certification, essentially as a prerequisite to actually undertake businesses in Ghana. Another one is the implementation creation of a data a cybersecurity court, which could deal with all forms of data breaches, um, any form of tech, um, any form of really tech breaches overall. And of course, Ghana is also reaching out to other regulators across um, the continent to discuss what are ways to harmonize data privacy guidelines across the continent. Uh, so with South Africa, what I've done is looked at it from a comprehensive legislation pr perspective. So they had the protection of personal information, um, which was enacted in 2013. So it is modeled after the General Data Protection Regulation, which is with the EU. So it has that comprehensive uh, model. So it really looks at the formation of data privacy officer, data processing, and what are ways to really consider whether or not a company has breached um, its data, uh, its obligation towards its consumers. So with all of that said, one thing I could definitely say is that Africa is in a sweet spot in a way, uh, really it's about, and there, we Africa is in a position where it could actually build greater awareness around data privacy and the risks around that. But it's also able to learn from the areas of implementation of data privacy laws globally. Uh, so essentially, we have seen issues, of course, within Europe, within the U.S., and just really taking that on board in, in terms of like how do we then frame that for Africa and not have the same make the same mistakes. Again. Um, African states are really at a place where there needs to be a, a data privacy guideline across um, for cross borders uh, transactions. But, and really, I think another point as well is really creating that regional body that oversees and implement data privacy guidelines with through a more hands on um, manner. And I think that with these bases that's coming on, the next protective measure would be that with these protective measures in place, it allows for a role in terms of boosting digital innovations and really looking at what are ways, what are ways to actually create innovations given the fact that there is a benchmark of protective measures in place. So I just thought it was really important to also, when I look at it from Africa's lens, is looking at where Africa is in terms of the technology. So for instance, Africa is at a place right now where there are going to be more than um, 
half a billion users by 2025 um, in relation to mobile. Um, there is a significant reliance on cafes as well. So it's not the traditional, everyone has a laptop, but there is that stronghold in, re in relation to the use, the use of mobile phones. So the way that I viewed it is, okay, well, with re in relation to data privacy, how do we also frame it to really to really hone in on the African culture. What data privacy should be in place for mobiles or for cafes in a way that's slightly different than um, other legislations? So I think that's just a little bit of a nugget that I um, was thinking about in relation to how data privacy can be um, utilized, but utilized in a way that really speaks to the African culture and not just um, a blanket statement there. Thank you. Thank you, Lindsay, for uh, this uh, short and brief uh, 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 presentation or uh, this uh, talk, actually not presentation, on, on this very important issue. And for me, actually, this is uh, a huge issue is that because it's privacy versus the free technology utilization, which need a lot of regulations to, to get the benefit without uh, the negative impact of it. Thank you. And I think we, we should uh, uh, we, we maybe uh, let the discussion to the end of the session. And before I introduce the second speaker, uh, Francis, uh, actually the conference, as we know, will uh, bring together all scholars, art, artists, uh, political, economic decision makers, uh, leaders, society, uh, civil society activists, professionals, practitioners from across the continent. Uh, and from uh, who are living also in the diaspora. So it, it will be a pity if we live without introduce and know each other and not network and use the technology correctly in the, in the best way. So I invite all of you to in the chat box to introduce yourself right to, to see you not speak to see you right to see you. Uh, where are you from from which country if you would like us to connect, connect each other, you can add uh, your uh, contact data, your uh, profession, everything. It's free, by the way. So use it. Use it in the best way. Let's know more, uh, know each other more, and network together more, and let the conference get the the maximum of its benefits of networking of all of us together. Thank you, and please be with us and stay to the end. Maybe you will have a couple of questions. And right now, I'd like to uh, again introduce uh, Francis. I checked and uh, uh, know that she's here. Please help her to be unmuted. Francis Mangini also uh, again worked and uh, consulted extensively on multilateral trade system. I will make it short because I introduced uh, Francis before. Francis has extensive experience uh, uh, in, in the field of trading system. Sorry. And uh, she worked with the African Union and United Nations uh, and uh, with other international organizations based at Geneva, Switzerland, and she was the regional trade policy advisor at the Commission of African Union. I'm sure that we will know more uh, about this important topic uh, from you, Francis. Uh, please come on and uh, start your presentation which is titled uh, Addressing the Prerequisite for the Implementation of African Continental Free Trade Area. Of course, this is important to know more. Thank you. You already started. Very good. The platform is yours. Right. Good morning. Good afternoon, everybody, from wherever you are. I so, have to apologize. Good. Francis is he. Okay, I'm sorry. my assistant <laughs> said no, she. <laughs> I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Don't worry at all about anything. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Amani. And uh, thank you, Lindsay, as well. So I would like to cover basically four areas. First of all, the introduction, socio political prerequisites and the trading prerequisites, because we are actually on the verge of beginning to trade. And then uh, some remarks on the going forward. Now, in terms of introduction, could I just suggest that uh, universities are the brains of the country, as a good friend of mine once said. So we uh, really look up to the academia 
as our brains, really, as countries and as a continent. And then uh, as Calistos, who is a good friend of mine, also said, when it comes to trade, Africa should be one country. Now, what is our vision as the African continental free trade area in the context of the African Union? We would like to be one African market, which however takes a developmental approach. And it's a, a market, but with areas uh, covering also cooperation in the areas of investment, competition, intellectual property, digital trade, which Lindsay has just been talking about, women and youth in trade. The developmental approach to regional economic integration means that you don't only establish free trade areas, you don't only uh, establish large markets, you go ahead to have programs on industrialization because a market without products to trade is not good at all for you. And then thirdly, you have infrastructure because if you have a market, you have products, but you don't have infrastructure, again, that market is not good for you. And inf infrastructure covers transport, both surface transport and air transport, as well as energy and the information and communications technology. And then of course, policy space as well. So to that end, we have got an agreement which in force, it entered in force on the um, 30th of May in 2019, just after, uh, just after one year uh, after being opened for signature. And it covers trading goods, trading services, and dispute settlement. There are protocols covering these areas. And we are now in the process of negotiating protocols on investment, competition policy, intellectual property, digital trade, women and youth. We expect to finish negotiations on the protocols on investment and competition policy by the end of September next month. So why is everybody talking about the African continent of free trade area? What's the value proposition? We are a continent of 1.4 billion people and counting, a median age of only 19.7 years, meaning youth, energy, dreams, and 60% of our people are young people. The gross domestic product of Africa is 7.4 trillion at purchasing power parity, dollars. And we have already achieved $4 trillion in consumer and business speaking, uh, spending. 43 of the 62 native minerals or elements for the fourth industrial revolution are in Africa. Many of them actually exclusively in Africa. And then 60% of uh, uh, unused arable land in the world is on the continent. Political will remains high and the implementation will lead to policy reforms for improving the business environment. So this then holds out actually a lot of value for the public sector, the private sector, and also the academia should be interested in uh, advancing uh, the cause of Africa. Now, let me at this point uh, suggest that uh, we need to get some facts right. Uh, and uh, talking to you, my colleagues, I think this is quite an important point because uh, many of the things that are said about the continent are not very accurate, actually. For instance, intra-Africa trade. You we used to hear of figures of 10%, 12%, uh, recently 15%, 17%, 18%. Those figures don't take into account some significant amounts of trade that take place on the continent, such as small scale informal trade, which it goes unrecorded. If you include that, uh, that trade and also take into account the small amounts, uh, which are rounded off to zero, right? Uh, the figure could come actually up to 29.5%. Uh, for some countries, uh, the, the, the trade with their neighbors is actually 30%, anywhere between 30% uh, to 80%, as you will just show, as I'll just show you uh, on the next slide. And then I've just said the GDP, uh, you know, GDP, combined GDP at purchasing power uh, parity is 7.4. Uh, trillion. So uh, the point I'm making here is that could we please get the narrative right? Because if we don't have the correct uh, narrative, if we don't have the correct figures and facts, then the policy we design can be flawed in fact. And uh, this would be a tragedy. So as I was saying, for instance, if you look at the uh, how much Eswatini trades with its neighbors, 85% Lesotho, 64%. Uh, all the way to Rwanda, which is 30%. However, some of our big economies like South Africa, Nigeria, and Egypt uh, trade much less with the 
other African countries. And it's actually these big economies that drag uh, that uh, average figure uh, down. Now, African exports to the rest of the world have been increasing um, in terms of volumes and values. However, the percentage has been falling uh, because we haven't been as competitive or caught up with the rest of the world. Now, what are some of the social political prerequisites? Uh, the trajectory uh, for popular support uh, remains uh, uh, quite good. So if you ask them about on the continent, I think they will be in support of the African continent of free trade area. So there is ownership. So we continue to strive for our political and economic emancipation, which has been our cause uh, since the Pan-African days up to, up to the moment and going forward into the future. We seek holistic actualization, political, economic, social, and shall I say to you, analytical as well. I have some photograph there of the uh, Pan-African Conference of 1945 and an invitation to the first one, which took place in 1900. So if you wanted to look at the timelines, our history then for Pan-Africanism, for our emancipation, both political, economic, and analytical, it actually goes back to uh, the year 19,000 when William Sylvester, who is from Trinidad and Tobago, uh, called the first conference in uh, London. It was attended only by 37 people, but uh, the 1945 one was attended by 90 people, and it has grown and grown up to where we are now. Now, we are all Africans trying very hard to be Ghanaians or Tanzanians, as Julius Nyerere said. Fortunately for Africa, we have not been completely successful. The outside world hardly recognizes our Ghanaianness or Tanzanianness. What the outside world recognizes about us is our Africanness, a call, a very strong call for African unity. And as Kwame Nkrumah said, I'm not African because I was born in Africa, but because Africa was born in me. Each one, each and every one of us should seek to see Africa incarnated in them. Africa should flow in their blood so that we own it and we protect it, we advance it. Now, in Emergent Africa, which is a book that uh, we prepared with the Calestos, we try to set out the history of uh, Pan-Africanism. And uh, this is supposed to be inspirational, to inspire new generations of uh, Africans uh, to get on board. So um, we start with a theory which says that uh, it's innate to fight against uh, disequilibrium, whether that's colonialism or poverty, and therefore, we as Africa have over the years been trying to seek ourselves um, our own emancipation. Then we say that uh, the political and economic freedom of Africa was set as our vision. We mapped it out. We codified it actually in the treaties. And then we started at the regional level through the regional economic communities, which in turn are supposed to combine to form the African continent or free trade area. Along the way, we have had some challenges and uh, therefore, uh, got a sense of what the critical success factors are for us to succeed. Infrastructure challenges, industrialization has been on the low end, and the risk has been quite high for investment. Governance challenges, geopolitical situation has been quite a challenge. We have seen, for instance, how the war in Ukraine has impacted adversely on us in a very short time. Wrong narratives, and of course, also administrative issues are the secretaries. So then the critical success factors that we need to bear in mind is that leadership is important to set a vision, put in place institutions, and to mobilize resources, and then to get the narrative right. We need political will. We need compliance or implementation in order to promote predictability. We need ownership and inclusiveness, not just by government, but by the private sector, by academia, by all stakeholders involved. And what we do must be relevant to the existential challenges we face in terms of pursuing our existential priorities. And we need to take a, a development approach to regional integration in order to be comprehensive in addressing the challenges that face us. And then we need to build our capabilities, the social political processes uh, for change. And we need secretaries as the technical arms of continental integration to be fit for purpose. These are key prerequisites for content integration uh, to happen. Now, there's a good friend of ours called uh, Landry Sine, who has said that if there's policy ambiguity, that's if you're not very clear about the policy you're pursuing, or if there's policy conflict, there are, you know, strident conflicts, you know, 
in the policy you're trying to pursue, then implementation will not be adequate. It will not be, it will not proceed as envisaged. So you need to, both within the policy and the epistemic com communities to be clear about what you are trying to do. And then you will be successful in the implementation. So this means that we need all these iterative processes for policymaking that should be inclusive and that should promote clarity about what we are trying to do so that all stakeholders are on board. So as we move forward, we are pursuing now Agenda 2063, which has got 15 flagship projects. Uh, the vision is to be integrated, to be prosperous, to be peaceful, and to be influential on the global scene. And an Africa that is uh, owned and driven by its own citizens. This is what we're trying to do under Agenda 2063. But in a publication that has just been put out, uh, by a number of us, we warn that there are existential priorities uh, which should be pursued in order to fight existential threats that uh, confront the continent, whether it's conflict, climate change, rogue technology, right, pandemics, public health uh, in general, including epidemics and disease outbreaks, disaffection and exclusion. All these things need to be addressed because if they are not addressed, we will not succeed. Now, we are ready to start trading because the agreement is in force. We have got oversight institutions in place like the Council of Ministers, the Dispute Settlement Body. We have got tariff schedules. These are liberalization uh, programs and services schedules as well. That's for goods and services. We have got the rules of origin in place. We've got manuals to help us deal with the rules of origin. And we've got this, these technical stamps and the uh, specimen signatures to allow us to start trading. So the point then is that we are actually ready. Everything is set for us to begin trading. And as a matter of fact, at the enterprise level as well, we have been checking. We've got consignments that are set, you know, to be shipped off to from one country uh, to the other. Uh, on the seventh to eighth of uh, um, October, we shall actually flag off some consignments at a huge uh, public event that should be pinned throughout the world. All the media will be there uh, to assist us uh, uh, witness it. We have also got uh, tools, e-tools, that help uh, uh, users, private sector, uh, should they uh, need them. Uh, for instance, we've got a market intelligence tool to help somebody find out trade and investment opportunities on the continent. That's Africa Trade Observatory. We've got a tool for addressing non-tariff barriers. It's actually accessible to anybody. You can actually open it right now, and you you can see that you can lodge a complaint if you have one, and uh, action will be triggered across the continent to address it speedily. Now, going forward, we need uh, evidence for policy, and uh, we would like to suggest that we need a triple helix kind of approach to research forums. Uh, this means we need research forums that have governments private sector and academia participating. So we can have presentations from academia that touch on issues that uh, governments need to address and get feedback uh, from the private sector who can advise us uh, where she actually pinches. We need an entrepreneurial approach to education that people should graduate, not just with the paper documents, but with the business ideas, actually businesses that are going concerns or at least project bankable proposals. Uh, this approach has been pioneered in some countries around the world, like Costa Rica and India. And we need community incubation centers. If you think innovation is important, turning ideas, dreams, even problems into business ideas, into businesses actually, into solutions to problems, then you need assistance at community levels across the continent uh, to help people so that they can uh, pursue their dreams. Uh, through assisting them to put them into, uh, translate them into businesses. So some questions then finally. Uh, regional economic communities, uh, we remain on board. Up to the end, they, it's like a system of local government. We have got the continent institutions, but Africa is big. Africa is 30 million square kilometers. You can fit the US, China, India, Europe all of them into Africa. So you need a system of local government, government uh, in order for it to be uh, manageable. Uh, we have advanced uh, in the negotiations, um, uh, which is a, uh, um, 
uh, what what we need now is uh, um, we need experienced uh, negotiators to build on this, uh, and uh, we hope that uh, uh, we, we can have a network, a pool. Uh, this is what I'm trying to say: a pool, an institutional memory of negotiators, pan Africanist negotiators that can carry this uh, forward. We need to maintain the momentum, the high momentum that we have now. So we need to have political leadership, private sector leadership, uh, leadership in the academia on board. And uh, what are the global threats that we need to keep confronting? I think they are looking us in the face and we need to uh, look them back in the face and address uh, uh, them. We have missed the customs union, which was supposed to be established in 2019. However, we are on course to establish the African common market uh, by next year. Because if you look at the African continent of free trade area, we've actually made a state. We are headed towards the common market in terms of free movement of goods, services, investment, and people, as well as rights of residents and the establishment. So we need to actually continue consolidating uh, the, the common market which we have uh, studied. Now, governments need to shift into this gear of sharing or pulling their sovereignty. Uh, alone, we are weak, as everybody knows, but together we are much uh, stronger. Uh, there's a strength in, in unity. So we need to really deal with this idea of pulling over our sovereignty. There has been this idea that we should cede, our government should cede sovereignty. Of course, that's quite sensitive, and we don't need to use exp expressions like that. Uh, we can instead talk about uh, pulling and sharing of our unity. Right. So these are my contacts in case somebody wants to get uh, in touch with me. Now, Professor Amani, uh, back to you. Thank you so much for the opportunity to make this uh, presentation. I congratulate the organizers for this huge event. And thank you for spicing it with music and with the art, which is so beautiful indeed. Uh, back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Francis. Actually, you are the man. <laughs> <laughs> we need you to more to, to know more about these important topics, and I totally agree with you. I totally agree with you that uh, with the recommendation of us to have a evidence for policy for Triple Helix Research Forum and for entrepreneurial approach uh, to education and community incubator uh, or incubation centers. Actually, for me, I believe that uh, entrepreneur uh, and entrepreneurship should be an uh, important pillar in uh, modernizing our higher education in Africa. And also I totally agree with you that we, uh, that we need to have a SWOT analysis to have a universal Africa. And I like the term very much, universal Africa. And now is the time of the about uh, more than 100 speakers uh, included in uh, the panel to start to, to um, Share your thoughts, your comments, your feedback. Please use this opportunity. This is very important opportunity with uh, a click on our mobiles and in our uh, laptop. We are collected and connected together. We are from different countries, from Ghana, Malawi, Kenya, South Africa, Nigeria, Tunisia, Algeria, wow, Senegal, uh, Morocco, UK, Egypt, and Sierra Leone. And who else there? Please express yourself and identify yourself. You are with us here. Um, if you have a questions, I would like to ask the moderators how we will take the questions or the comment. Is it by uh, uh, writing the chat box or uh, raising a hand and unmute them? Uh, Chief Dra, uh, it's for you to guide us how we can uh, discuss uh, here. All right, Prof. Um, thank you very much. So right here in Ghana, we have some special <laughs> invited guests here in the uh, conference room. So I'll pass the microphones around for them to share their comments, um, questions, concerns. So a, a hand up will do, and I'll bring you the microphone, please. Hello, hello, hello. The, you, yeah, you, can you hear me? Yes, you are. You are. You come back. Yes, again, please. I didn't hear your uh, uh, intervention. Okay, so right here in Ghana, I have some invited guests in the conference room, and they want to share their comments and questions. Uh, to the session. So I'll pass the microphone around and then they share their views. Yes. And also we have a question here also from Klisha. Uh, Klisha, where are, are you from? Can you write till we get the question from the, the hall? And I can see Dr. Violet Makuku. Hello, hello, hello. Hello. How are you? How Thank are you? you. 
How are I'm you? good. How are you too? Fine. Should I go okay. ahead? The question okay. is for Dr. Violet. Okay. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, I think the subject that we are talking about today is very, very important. You know, now it's even more than three, four years that uh, uh, the issue of the African continental free trade area uh, came up. But what I've noted from the social discussions and uh, from interacting with uh, different people as I move around the continent doing our AAU work is that mm -hmm. people are not really aware, number one, of the existence of the African continental free trade area. Number two, some, even if they are aware, they still need a lot more information. You know, knowing of its existence is one thing, but knowing the details and the nitty gritties of what the African continental free trade area is all about is another thing. So I'm saying, what are we doing in terms of the information and communication and uh, dissemination machinery so that we even get to the raw areas? You know, when we talk of, uh, I remember the last speaker, was also looking at uh, the inter-African country trade. How can we now uh, make sure we will also bring those in the rural communities where yam and uh, these other um, uh, crops, which we can trade among our countries, can now know a lot about the African continental free trade area, package uh, their products, make them suitable for the market. You know, it's only people in urban areas who now rush there again, get those things at a cheaper price, come and package them without even telling them that they are pushing them into the continental free trade area. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. So um, I'll be taking some more and as we call And then late. we have one from your side and one from the platform. Absolutely. We are so we have one from here that will do um, <laughs> yeah. prep for the, yes. the ones join us secretary. So, yes. uh, the hand up, please. Glisha, Glisha here. Uh, she has a very good question. Uh, she's from uh, Atlanta, Georgia. Can you unmute her or uh, should I read the question? What do you think? I, I suggest you read the question for us, please, Prof. Actually, I, where is the question? I lost the question, please. Can, can, you, can you come here and read it? What is the direct issue? What is the direct huh? communication? Implication, yes. Oh. The Af yeah, African free trade area. Yes, yeah. Patricia asking about the implication of uh, the uh, uh, implication of uh, free trade area. Can you unmute her? I think it's better to, to let people speak. Okay, okay. So, um, technical team, um, let's unmute uh, our participant from Atlanta so she can share her view. Question, please. Yes, and until then, we can get a comment or question from your side, okay? Sure. So I think um, participants joining online should raise your hands. Uh, use the hand raising icon um, to draw the attention of the technical team so we can allow them to share their questions. So we cannot come back to the room. Um, and let's get your views. Yeah, we are talking about free trade in Africa. Can you introduce um, yourself, sir? Pastor Dr. Antonia Nyamsempoku um, from um, Ministry of Education, Ghana Education Service. Welcome, Dr. Kumasi. Um, I just want to ask, we are talking about free trade in Africa. We know there are regulators. 
um, helping us making this happen. But do we have the structures whereby um, from one end, one knows where he'll be operating and situations like that. Because I don't think without the required structures, this can just happen. So if now that we are thinking, making this happen, what can we do? Thank you very much, Reverend Dr. Yamase Mpoku. Um, okay, can we ask uh, one of the speakers to respond for this uh, question? Okay. Lindsay? So Yes, sure, absolutely. Um, well, first, thank you guys so much for your questions and comments as well. So I think what I'm going to do is probably combine a little bit of um, the questions that you've been asking and just kind of see if I can make it as holistic as possible. Uh, one of the speakers, sorry, one of the audience had mentioned about awareness, um, how it's really important to, well, essentially stating how can we ensure that um, that the general population have access and understanding of what the African content of, the content of free trade agreement is. I think that that's actually a really valid um, question. One thing, one of the things I have I'm understanding is that there is that lack of awareness. But I think that the reason why is because there isn't that understanding of accessibility. Uh, that, and that's actually quite problematic within itself. Uh, and that also ties back to the whole data privacy as well. So it's really hard for me to kind of say, look, this is the structure that we need to implement in order to inform awareness. But one thing I could definitely say is Senegal has done um, actually a pretty good job in terms of raising campaign awareness about data privacy, which could also tie into African content of, content of free trade agreement as well. They have, for instance, not just on the website, but I think they actually have public campaigns around um, technology. What does that mean in terms of their rights and their privacy? I think that utilizing such framework can be utilized within the African content of free trade agreement. Um, I think that another thing as well is that we need to ensure that the African content, not the, the African content free trade agreement is not limited to the roundtable discussion of educators and academics, but it is actually out in the street that it is brought to yeah. schools. It's also brought to businesses as well. Um, there's so many that ties in with it, as mentioned. So it's not just um, the free trade, but there is the intellectual property side of things. There's competition. Um, so yes, comp like competition policy. So it, it, it doesn't have to be limited to um, just where we are, but really small businesses that are taking on consumers, what does it look like in terms of gaining consumer trust through technology? So that's definitely one thing I would definitely um, give my little two piece, I should say, if anything. Um, so that's a starting point. Uh, but yes, I'll, I'll probably stop there. There was another question yeah, yeah. Um, and I apologize, I actually forgot the question, but we'll go from there. Okay. Back to you. So we can, we can also hear from um, um, Dr. Francis about the points raised by Reverend Yamisen Poku about the structures that ought to be put in place to ensure that uh, the after policy is successful. Right, yes. So those are very important questions that have been uh, uh, raised and beginning with uh, the one that uh, was raised by the Reverend. And since he is uh, from uh, Ghana, I'm going to be very specific. Um, there's a national coordination office that has been established to deal with the AFCFTA. So if you're a Ghanaian, that office is available to you to provide you with the information that you require on the AFCFTA. You can also be on the lookout for public events that are held from time to time. Like that was a very big one actually, just a month ago. Uh, it was in Accra here, however, uh, which attracted quite a number of participants to launch the national framework for the AFCFTA. Now, having said that about Ghana, I should also mention that other countries are doing the same across the continent, are trying to put in place contact points or national inquiry points. And uh, in, in general terms, it's usually the ministries responsible for trade and the chambers of commerce. So if you go to them, you'll get information about the AFCFTA. But of course, uh, as uh, the first speaker, from the floor uh, said, 
maybe it's the chicken and egg is question is situation where if you don't know about the AFCFTA in the first place, you will not ask about it. So that's why, as Lindsay said, we need these uh, huge awareness creation programs across uh, uh, the continent. Uh, but could I say now, talking to educators, that we need uh, a systemic way of doing it. Uh, we need to ingrain the AFCFTA into our curriculum. So we need curriculum reforms that introduce the AFCFTA into uh, onto our into our syllabus. Now, regarding the other question on value addition, yes, this is a valid question that you can get uh, the same product being uh, being sold by maybe. A, a street, uh, maybe a, a, a small scale enterprise, an SME, a small to medium enterprise, or by a woman. And then uh, someone gets it, packages it well, and the price increases by 10 times. So this is uh, sort of uh, taking advantage of um, our small operators. So again, the national offices should help with uh, this kind of things. Value addition is a priority of priorities on the continent. So there need to be programs that educate producers, especially the small scale producers on how to get the best returns for their products, but also to handhold them. This is why I mentioned incubation, community incubation centers on how to get the most returns uh, from uh, their products. Now, regarding implications of the AFC FTA for higher education. So I think this is now the time to begin having deep analytical work that is centered on the AFC FTA. The AFC FTA is quite broad. It covers many areas. So there are quite you know, important topics that can be a part of the coursework students do, research papers for degrees, and also research uh, uh, forums. That we have raised, yeah. uh, Thank we you, have, Doctor. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, so we have more three hands, as Prof said. We have Sani yeah. Kasimu. I've seen your hand. Uh, you're online. Please let's uh, or mute her. We, we would like we have... to, 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 to see the other face of the coin, the diaspora, yes. African diaspora. Alicia, can, yes. can you express your... Uh, what do you see the situation here in Africa regarding the discussed the topic? Good day, everyone. Um, Good day. Everyone as well. My name is Dr. Kalisha Graves. I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. I serve as the Chief Research Education and Programs Officer at the Martin Luther King Jr. Center for Nonviolent Social Change. I'm also a university professor. And I think um, the gentleman may have answered some of my question already, but if you were speaking to college or university presidents, how would you define or explain the implications of the African Continental Free um, Trade Agreement for their institutions, right? Like how can presidents and, and universities get directly involved in this? I think you may have um, answered some of the question already, but that was my initial question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, it's better to collect the whole uh, uh, questions. Sani? We'd like to see your videos on, please. Um, when you're asking your question, let's see your face. Yes, please. If you can open your camera, it will be very nice. Let's uh, okay. move the barrier. Good, uh, good, good afternoon. Here from Nigeria, we are in the afternoon. Yeah. I'm Stanley Kasim from Federal University of Ukari. Yes, uh, this is a good opportunity for all of us. My question is, with African free trade in operation, does that mean African continent is moving towards or now wholly free market operation? If yes, Africans should dominate the market. Africans should dominate the market because the why the, the, the all other continent that have, have developed economically will penetrate and dominate the market. And our brothers in the diaspora should do something. Then again, issue if this is allowed, we need to checkmate issue of debt foreign debt, particularly foreign debt in African continent, and also domestic debt that comes with corruptions and, 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 and use it as a political opportunity 
to siphon public fund and enrich themselves. Because what is bedeviling African is debt, is debt. This debt make us to be in the African to remain in iron cage, which is a form of neocolonial, listen, it's a form of neocolonialism. We are Africa with our endowed resources. We cannot find warehouse of gold anywhere in Africa, but we can find it in, 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 in England, France, Canada, and the rest. And again, this, this, this market operation make it in such a way through debt where there is the conditionality attached in debt. You will come to the market and operate. The, the, the creditors can go to anywhere and operate. With free market operation in Africa, it is an opportunity where Africa will also penetrate and do something. And this time should also be considered when issuing loan to Africa. And Africa should be careful because the loan is making us not to develop. They define what we we'll do. They define what we do. They will, they, 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 since we are, we are, we are, we, we, should create, we, should, we can use our resources for African money. Since we are clamoring to moving towards having one African country, which is a good development, which our our many many, many of our, our 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 predecessors have tried. I think the only way for us, the only medium for an instrument for us is through intellectual capacity, intellectual argument, intellectual presentation. I rest my case. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Sani. I see uh, Francis Kofi Kranche. Um, your hands are up. You have a hand up, please. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, good thank afternoon. you for this opportunity. Uh, it's interesting to follow this topic. Uh, I am a lecturer at the University of Cape Coast Faculty of Law. I teach international trade and investment law and other courses too. I am also a founder uh, for the Center for African Trade and Investment Policies. So when we come to the, the after, I followed it, the discussions and the processes and the negotiations for a while. But like uh, one uh, contributor you know, observed that uh, we begin to have this uh, forum for more of for academic discussions and for uh, you know, other forums other than for the practitioners. I am a national council member for the Ghana International Chamber of Commerce, or Ghana National Chamber of Commerce and Industry, representing the central region too. And I should have to say that many of our informal sector and the SMEs are not aware of this uh, big forum and this opportunity there. Now, so we need to discuss how we can have uh, the opportunities to bring this down to the people who are involved. In Ghana, for instance, uh, we have about 95% of the businesses uh, made up of uh, SMEs. And uh, recently I published a paper you know, discussing that and how they can be financed in that regard. So we must look at the, the, the tariffs and the non tariff infrastructure that actually impedes uh, trade in Africa. Now we are saying that the AFTA is at the second phase of a negotiation. There was a short paper I did in the, in the Financial Times and I questioned why Ghana is even leading this because Ghana as of now does not even have a competition law or antitrust law. And so if individual countries are not prepared in their state legislation that we can harmonize and then take uh, observation from, for example, Ghana, then it is very problematic you know, to think that we will succeed. Because even at the first phase, we know that infrastructure, in terms of especially with the non tariff infrastructure, it's not so much you know, uh, on the ground. So we need to be very careful uh, going through the, this process and make sure that we are not so much in tune. The market is there. But we should also think of the threat that the Asian Caribbean market, which is now bigger, you know, we say that the uh, the after is bigger because in terms of the countries involved. But if you look at the Asian Caribbean Union, which has come up launched last year or two, it has a bigger you know, platform in terms of the of the of the population. You put China, you put Japan, you put Singapore and their population together, it is very huge. So, and then also to think that most of the national legislations you know, do not, or the after uh, protocol do not actually preclude uh, the countries from 
having other pact, other agreements with nations outside Africa. So my point is that we should take this out of the academic and then the, the, the intellectual discussions and go down there and involve the stakeholders, have a lot of educations on the ground so that we can make impact with this uh, initiative, which is very important. And let me also note that we know trade and alliance or integration, but the after is just the first phase of the linear progression of trade inter integration. And so there is a, a long way to go to move from this stage to get the end of where we are going to have a monetary or even the economic integration. So if we don't do the first phase, as a Basar would put it, right, it will be very difficult to proceed. So uh, thank you for this opportunity. Looking forward that we subsequently have a, a good discussion and come out with a, a good position uh, to, to, to support this initiative for Africa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we can put our hands together for all the, the session and the officiators, um, Professor Amania Sharif, Dr. Francis Manjani, and Ms. Lindsay Hackley. Thank you very much for your time, your insights. Thank you, um, all. thank you all. And from my side, I think uh, we just opened the door uh, for uh, addressing the prerequisite for the implementation of African continental free trade area. This is an important uh, uh, issue and topic, and I invite all the partner organize this very important uh, conference to have another forum to discuss this in more details and again awareness awareness and adoption for the entrepreneurial approach uh, is very important for harmonization because harmonization needs awareness and legalization and thank you for moderating this session and thank you for all the people in ghana in aau uh, hello from egypt and hello everyone and thank you again Thank, Thank you guys so for having me. Let us with our presence, put our hands together as we're bringing this into an end. So for our program, we are now going to start with the opening ceremony. And I'll begin by introducing some of the um, special guests here during the opening ceremony. We have um, the Secretary General of the Association of African Universities, Professor Olusha Loyewele Prof. Please, can you humbly uh, rise up to this point for us, please, to the podium? Um, so put our hands together for him, please. And he will be joined by Prof His Excellency, Her Excellency Professor Abdullah Busia, Ghana's ambassador to Brazil. Put your hands together for Professor, Her Excellency Professor Abdullah Busia. I'll be giving a detailed profile of them as she makes her way up. We can do it better. Put your hands to the nice people. And chairing the session is um, Her Excellency Arikana Chihomboruk Powell, a medical doctor and activist. Uh, she's a public speaker, educator, and diplomat, founder of the Medical Clinics and Entrepreneur. Um, she'll be joining us. I hope she is with us. But let me do a quick one with our special guest seated here. Um, her Excellency Abuna Pokwa Adon Pimbusia is a Ghanaian writer, a poet, feminist, lecturer, and diplomat. She is the daughter of the former Prime Minister of Ghana, um, His Excellency Kofi Abifa Buzia, and sister of the actress uh, Kofi Abuzia. She is an associate professor in literature and English, uh, and also a woman, a women's and gender studies at Rutgers University. Put your hands together for her as she joins us today in our opening ceremony. And also, uh, Professor Lushola Bandele Oyewele is a Nigerian professor of food science and technology, um, educational administrator, and former vice chancellor for the Federal University of Agriculture, and currently the Secretary General of the Association of African Investors. Put your hands together for him as uh, he sits with us today for the opening ceremony. I wouldn't miss words, I would kindly call on um, Her Excellency. Arikana Chilomboru Kwao to do that as the others with the opening remarks, if she's online. Okay, so uh, pardon me, I will just have to move on and take the AAU anthem, then the opening remarks will begin. So we'll have to rise humbly for the anthem of the Association of African Universities and also the African Union Anthem. 
So they both go uh, in, in tandem. So the first, the AAU, and the second is the African Union. So, um, this is for you to just have a few uh, a little bit as we sort out uh, the letters we're experiencing now. Okay, so we're true with it. Now we we'll have to rise again humbly for the African Union anthem. And also to inform you that we're joined by um, His Excellency Abdul Rahman Diallo, the UNESCO representative, Ghana. You're welcome. So together we take the African Union anthem. Let us all unite and celebrate together. The victory is won for our liberation. Let us dedicate ourselves to rise together to defend our liberty and unity.
we can put our hands together for ourselves. So touched by the refrain, we can have a seat. Nice people, please have a seat. Thank you, seats, please. So, so touched by the refrain of the African Union anthem that says that all sons and daughters of Africa, flesh of the sun and flesh of the sky, let us make Africa the tree of life. You are welcome to the opening ceremony of the World Conference on Education and Restitution brought to you by the AAU. Good afternoon. It's with great pleasure to have all of you here this afternoon. And I'm happy to say that there are about 90 countries that are represented participating in this conference. And I am so elated that even from Brazil and Suriname, uh, there are others that manage to uh, be spirited into Ghana, and we are grateful. <laughs> Professor Abna Busia has already been introduced. So I am here because travel and other challenges have prevented some from being here physically. And I'm grateful to just welcome you before the great uh, Secretary General will, will speak. Your Excellencies, honorable members, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the planning committee, I welcome all of you here today. This is a joint venture, a venture that has been embarked upon by UNESCO, AAU, and the Pan-African Heritage World Museum. So grateful for all that AAU with its head have done for us, providing the space for here and for this meeting, providing technical help, financial resource, and the hearty welcome that anyone who walks into this space feels welcome. We appreciate this. We are also here because of the great effort that the planning committee has put into making this a reality. Believe it or not, the planning has not been easy, but to have people from Jamaica, Colombia, Brazil, United States, UK, Suriname, participate in the planning, we should give them a round of applause. We are here also because participants like you, delegates, decided to come. And so thank you so much for coming. This conference assembles eminent scholars, artists, artists, diplomats, entrepreneurs, activists, spiritual leaders, African student organizations and institutions from around the world. The conference has been curated on this very topic. It is, how do people of African descent, Afro descendants around the world and Africanists claim and reclaim that which has always been theirs. It is through education and restitution. These are at the heart of the conference that is being held. And it's not just people giving speeches, 
but also we have cultural performers here that will lace what is being discussed with performances that will make tangible and meaningful that which is being discussed. This is a world conference. It is a conference that enables us to rethink education so that we can achieve a renaissance further. We are finding ways of reclaiming that which has belonged to us. And I have been boring people with their can saying that the rightful owner of any property does not apologize when that person is repossessing that which has been taken away from him or her. And this is not regarding artifacts, but it's about people's understanding of themselves, their notions of who they are, their past, their present, and their future. Further, we are here to pay attention to, as has already been done, aspects of African free trade so that we will know that we are active participants in forging a future that we want, a future that we own, a future that is holistic, not just for people of African descent, but for the totality of humanity. We are here being involved in this conference because of the goodwill of those that have gathered and what others have done. It's a conference that is being held physically in Ghana and virtually at multiple locations around the world where we find people of African descent as well as Africanists. We hope that by participating you will be able to build connections and networks across generations, space, and time zones. Through what we learn and share in this conference, we hope that we will reinvigorate ourselves and be propelled into a future that has meaning in the rough and tumble of life. Let us be filled with curious conjunction of circumstances, actions, and thoughts. It is a pleasure to have you all here this afternoon. Be proud of yourselves for being part of this. And we hope that the deliberations from this conference will bear fruit beyond the last day. Thank you. We'll now call upon the Puba himself, Professor Olusola Oyewule, Secretary General of the Association of African Universities. Good afternoon. Good morning. And also good evening, since we are connected from different parts of the world. Your Excellency, Madam Chairperson Africana, Your Excellencies, members of the Diplomatic Corps, representatives of UNESCO present here today, and the Pan African Heritage World Museum who are co-organizers of this particular conference, distinguished guests from across the world who are physically present or are connected virtually, distinguished session chairs, speakers, discussants and rapporteurs, invited guests, 
ladies and gentlemen, I welcome every one of us to this joint conference on education and restitution co-organized by the Association of African Universities, the Pan-African Heritage World Museum, and UNESCO. For us at the Association of African Universities, this is our version of our yearly homecoming diaspora program, which started three years ago. Let me especially welcome our diaspora brothers and sisters who are participating in this conference, especially those who are fiscally present here, and all those who are in different countries of Africa and even beyond Africa contributing to African development. Ladies and gentlemen, I've come to welcome us with this short speech, which I have titled, Time to Regain Our Consciousness and Rekindle Hope for the Future of Africa. Time to Regain Our Consciousness and Rekindle Hope for the Future of Africa. I hope that in this meeting, African academics, researchers, and opinion leaders will not lead us to contribute to lament the past without showing us the roadmaps to make Africa great as we move to the future. I believe that the time of lamenting the past should stop. We need to have a roadmap or some roadmaps into the future and not lamenting about the past. As Africans, I personally believe that we have no reason to continue to make excuses of what has happened in the past. This is not a time to continue with the blame game for any failure to take over the destiny of our lives and our continent. Indeed, we should stop lamenting what have been done to our ancestors. Rather, we should be talking to ourselves and announcing to the future that we shall regain the lost grounds. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the time to regain our consciousness and rekindle the hope for a great Africa. I hope that in the course of this conference, we can come up with workable proposals that can help Africans to regain the lost years and move into the future with great op optimism. I will wish that we avoid the usual intel I mean, theoretical discussion and let us tell ourselves the truth. We need to take some actions to help not just ourselves, but our continent. From this distinguished gathering of a community of eminent ac academics, scholars and experts, I anticipate a forward-looking perspective and narratives that will shape progressive discourses vital in advancing African education and culture by not just deliberating on the past, but most importantly, charting a way for the present and the future, systematically and vigorously. This conference is a great platform for the AU and its current membership of 
415 higher education institutions spread across Africa for us to network and partner with each other for our development. As mentioned earlier on by the earlier speaker, we need education and restitution to regain the loss, the, the past glories. This conference is coming, coming up to coincide, to coincide with the 31st of August day declared by the United Nations as the International Day for the people of African descent to celebrate the diverse heritage and several contributions of people of African descent to the continent. The theme of this World Conference on Education and Restitution is, and I quote, the past, the present, and the future. Afrofuturism and Africa's development. And it's been sponsored on three important sub-themes. It's been promoted on three important sub-themes. Number one, addressing the prerequisites for the implementation of the African continental free trade area. I listened to the first session discussion and I want to appreciate all of us for our concerns to make this workable. Number two, rethinking education excellence in Africa. This is something that should concern every one of us. We are getting to a point in which governments in Africa appears to be neglecting higher education. It's sad to note that in some places, just like Nigeria, universities have been closed for the past six months. It's also sad to note that many of our governments in Africa still depend on foreign intellectual contents for their own development, neglecting their own intellectuals at home and their intellectuals in the diaspora. I hope that we, cannot, we can no longer continue this way. The third area sub team that this conference will be focusing on is on reclaiming and reconceptualizing African arts, culture, and heritage. Three important pillars that nobody can develop for us, but we ourselves. If Africa continue to, to neglect its culture, its arts, and its heritage, we we'll probably be destroying ourselves because it is us, we should promote them. Ladies and gentlemen, we have assembled many African distinguished, many distinguished Africans and lovers of Africa to provide us with more positive outlooks, to look at the past with the purpose of regaining what we have lost and move into a great future by reconceptualizing and reclaiming African arts, culture, and heritage. The African Continental Free Trade Agreement is an excellent initiative for the development of the African economic system. We are ever need to develop strategies for engaging the greater potentials of this initiative for African development. In the first discussion, we are very clear that we have the, this uh, after initiative on paper, but how much have we been able to promote it to the average farmer so that this initiative will benefit them? Ladies and gentlemen, I believe our universities have important roles to play. It's high time our universities start to groom the future farmers, the future trader, the future businessman for the African continent. We are expecting that in the course of this conference, strategies that Africa and its people from all over the world will adopt to see that the African continental free trade area 
is fully implemented and, ben and it benefits all Africans. I'm very convinced, as I mentioned earlier on, that one of the strategies that we should employ is to promote excellence in African higher education system. Quite often in many places that I go, I quite often lament on the curricula that we use in many African universities. Many countries are still, and universities are still using curricula handed over by the colonial past. I have not been able to change them. And no wonder our graduates come out from our various institutions and they claim that they are unemployable and they need to be retrained for them to be relevant to the needs of the industry. Ladies and gentlemen, this should not continue. We need to promote excellence in our African higher education system. This excellence strive should start by redefining our curricula for teaching and learning in African universities and ensure that graduates, that our graduates possess the skills and competencies required for them to contribute to African development. Ladies and gentlemen, what you are saying concerns every one of us. Let us build a resilient African education system that can withstand the test of time and respond proactively to emerging issues like the pandemic, such as the COVID-19 and the recent pox, I won't say monkey pox, the recent pox that appears to be emerging, which some people still want to attribute to Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, we have some things in Africa that we need to be proud of. Our language, our songs, our music. Let us use our language, our songs, our music, our thoughts, and other cultural forms to solve African problems peculiar to Afro descendants. Our expectations from this conference are, is very high. Over 2,000 people from 90 countries have registered to join at various sessions. And this raises the stick even higher. We look forward eagerly to the report of this summit to develop concrete action points for implementation after this conference. Let me thank all the participants, including those who are present physically at the Secretariat at this particular time, and those who are connected virtually. Let me also thank the co-sponsors or co-organizers of this conference, especially my brother here coming from UNESCO. One thing that connects all of us together is our commitment to the development of Africa. On behalf of the Association of African Universities, let me welcome every one of us again to this conference with the hope that our deliberations in this conference will challenge us as Africans to contribute our best for the future development of the African continent. Thank you very much for listening. Ladies and gentlemen, you can do it better. Put your hands together for the Secretary General for the Association of African Universities. And at this moment, I will want to lay the room and just increase our spirits uh, to wait for the Lilies uh, dance crew.
Denise, thank you. Please come inside and then give us your special dance. Let's put our hands together for Lily's dance crew.
Allá huyó. Awesome artistry they displayed and talk of artistry we'll have more and one is from her excellency abna buzia who'll be giving us a very very chilling poetry put your hands together for her as she makes her way to this way thank you very much i think that's the first time i've ever been introduced as about to give something thrilling but I hope you enjoy it. You know, Professor, one of the things I thought of when those of us on the board of the Pan African Museum were the Academic Council were asked to think of things to propose. One of the things I had in mind was a session on my father's little book a purposeful education for Africa, which is almost 60 years old. I changed my mind and have proposed the panel that I'm doing on the third day because I thought rather than look to the past, I'd look to the future. But I was reading that book 
because the Busia Foundation is preparing a reprinting of father's, three of father's classic works about Africa. Everybody knows the position of the chief, which is still in print. But we are thinking next year of reprinting the challenge of Africa, Africa in search of democracy, and a purposeful education for Africa. And when I heard your comments this morning, I realized how relevant a purposeful education still was. So put it on your curriculum. <laughs> you know? But in fact, it is also relevant for what I'm doing today. Because in rereading that book, which I realize now remains a classic, I read the lines education must pass on the heritage of the past, cope with the present and prepare for the future, which could be an epigram for this conference. And though those lines in fact undergird the study that he did and really inspired me to go through that work, to write the short poem that is the last poem I will read this morning. But it also inspired me to go through my own work. So I want to begin with two short pieces. One not my own. One a poem I love, which the um, West Africa and Sahel Committee discovered when we were working on our West Africa, on the second volume the West African Sahel volume of Women Writing Africa, a four volume piece which collection which we published between, I think what it was 2002 and 2008 or nine, and um, which has won awards and which I'm very proud to say is transforming the curriculum of a number of schools and universities, because until we published them, people used to argue that there was no easily compend, no good compendium of African women's writings. And we have given you four volumes going back to ancient Egypt. So, um, but we discovered this piece called An African Schoolgirl's Song, which is published in the West African Sahel volume and it's by Gladys Casely Hayford. Um, Casely Hayford, the daughter of um, Adelaide Casely Hayford, born Smith, who married our Ghanaian Casely Hayford. And I'm beginning with it because it's an interesting piece by a daughter whose mother was a groundbreaker who was educated at the end of the 19th century on in both the United States, in both um, here on the African continent and in different places in Europe, traveled to the United States and founded a women's organization, returned to her native Liberia to found a school, was a complete earth shattering groundbreaker in her life and in everything she did and gave that spirit to her daughter, although they were very different in temperament. So this little poem is interesting and one can, oops, sorry, one can read it, I think, with some kind of perspective on her, the irony, if you like, of a woman negotiating and asking questions about the nature of a new Africa, a united Africa, and the context of women's education in it because of the very interesting, for want of a better word, juxtaposition between what the women are doing and what they are dreaming of. Beat, 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 dears, beat the golden grain, for food builds up the sinews and stimulates the brain. Just as you beat rice deers with your pestle in your hand, you beat distrust and bloodshed out of Africa, our land. 
Clean, 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 dears. Clean the silver fish. Drop its shimmering, shining scales, then lay it on the dish. Tis destined in the future, little Africans, that you shall clean away the scales that hide true Africa from view. Burn, 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 dears. Burn the sweet palm oil. And every mother's son's dears will thank you for your toil. For in the years to come, dear, while other nations and shout, you'll burn the heart of Africa till all its dross burns out. Grind, 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 dears, pepper ripe and red. For there are many hungry, eager, strong black lads who, who must be fed. Your dear black hands that guide the stone will remain faithful still to guide and comfort Africa when passing through life's mill. I could write a whole dissertation about the ironies of form and content in that. <laughs> but the second one, the second poem I want to share is one of mine, which I wrote as a, both as a prologue and a coda to a collection of essays on African women's history, and in fact, African women's disappeared history, called Transforming Visions, which was edited by Claire Rob by Wando Achebe, Chinua Achebe's brilliant and distinguished daughter and her colleague Claire, Claire Robertson. Transforming visions and it's based, my poem is based around the central question they asked in the preface to the book. What do we know and how do we show it? How do they speak of us? And what do we say? How do we work to shape our own self-display? What sacred systems do we share? When and how divined? When do we shield our arms? And when do we field them? What fears or faiths do we hold? And when do we yield them? How do we mobilize Around what do we rally? Then when we stand or run, what is our tally? When we've been bought and sold, who is valued, who is martyred? And when we buy and sell, what sorts out what's bartered? Who tells us what to learn and who stops to listen? Who shows us where to go and what stops the flow? What burdens do we share to bear all lives that matter? Who loves or loves me not? And who calls me home? Who names or names me not? And who calls me out? Who cheats and beats and shouts? Who harms my soul? Who shares in the care to transform and make me whole? These are our stories. This is what we know, and here we show it. Cracked mirrors reflect light. Clear ones reflect it. These are our new points of view. What was dim made bright so wrongs can be set right. Changed perspectives, visions transformed. And <laughs> thank you. That poem is structured, I didn't say it, but it's actually, as a preface, it's actually structured around the questions the volumes asked. And I've done a similar thing with the one I wrote for you the one I wrote this morning <laughs> for this conference, based on my father's statement that I read about what education needs to do, and that is pass on the heritage of the past, cope with the present, and prepare for the future. Because it struck me that at its heart, 
that sentence has the recognition, or perhaps more rightly, the faith that education has a deeply moral, communal, and collective purpose. And we are still asking the questions he posed to this day. Who has what rights of kin? In claiming the heritage of our past, who do we say we are? What is that past? From where do we accumulate this knowledge we know we must gather to survive? What is heritage and what an inheritance? And how and with whom do we share it? If national independence must lead to international interdependence, then what means these legacies of borders, boundaries, and boundedness? In coping with this present, in what language and how do we speak? If our cultures are expressible in no language but our own, what mean these dreams of a common tongue? When home and school pull apart, to whom are we obliged? When school and work are not aligned, where is the place we live and what the life we give? To prepare for any future, how do we see who we can be? In this world of shaken beliefs, in this world of uncertain values, how do we still stand on faith to be free, to be free to be the people we are sure we must become and plan our new and purposeful futures. Thank you. Thank you so much. If we can do it better, put your hands together for Excellency Abnabuzia. So quickly also take um, some goodwill. Thank you. We would quickly take some goodwill messages from our various partner organizations, starting with the Ghana Commission for UNESCO. All right, put your hands together for our representative. They got a commission for UNESCO. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon once again. Um, my name is Christopher Wetcher, and I'm the program officer for culture for the Ghana Commission for UNESCO. My boss, Mrs. Amas um, Sewane Kwetete, was supposed to be here to deliver this statement, but she asked me to speak her words. So I'm going to read her words to us. Chairman of this session, um, Her Excellency, His Excellency Arikana um, Chihombori Kwao, Ambassador of Ghana to Brazil, Professor Abinabuzia, Head of Office, UNESCO Accra Office, Mr. Abdurrahman Idialu, Founder, Pan African Heritage World, Honorable Kojo Yanka, Secretary General, Association of African Universities, Professor Olusola Oyewale, Distinguished Speakers, discussants, scholars, and researchers, the media, ladies and gentlemen. It is an honor for me to be invited to give a goodwill message at this very important conference. First, I wish to commend the organizers of this timely conference, the Association of African Universities, Pan-African Heritage World Museum, UNESCO, and the government of Ghana for putting this conference together. It is important to me to mention that as a commission, we are committed to the improvement and development of education and heritage sectors of Ghana. For this reason, the commission does not hesitate to lend its support to any activity or conference that seeks to enhance Ghana's heritage 
and education sectors. In view of this, we fully support this conference. This conference is timely because we are in a dispensation where Africa needs to recon recontextualize its educational system and reclaim its cultures and heritages through innovative and other transformational initiatives. There is, th there is no doubt that this conference will contribute significantly to the dialogue, advocacy, and efforts being made by African governments on creating and establishing robust and resilient higher education and reclaiming the African heritage and identity through the restitution and reparation of illicitly trafficked cultural properties from the con continent. Most of us here are aware of the thousands of stolen African cultural properties in the Western world. Also, we are aware of the bureaucratic processes that need to be followed through the relevant conventions to make claims for these properties. It is imperative that detailed research is conducted to identify, document, inventorize these stolen cultural properties. Therefore, the role of academics research institutions, researchers, scholars in this restitution endeavor cannot be overemphasized. As we seek to, as we seek answers to how we can make Africa great and better, I would love to pose these questions with the view that the retinue of distinguished scholars, researchers and experts here will help to address them and come up with a recommendation or a framework which can be adopted by African governments in this restitution and reparation endeavor. Number one, what kinds of museums should be built for these properties whose provenances are not known? Number two, in what ways can we incorporate narratives and histories associated with these properties in our educational curriculum? Number three, how can we add value to these properties which already seems devalued by the Westings, Westerners to improve tourism. And finally, how can properties, how can the properties contribute to the decolonizing agenda and new independence of Africa? I look forward to a successful conference and I wish you a fruitful deliberation. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you. A little better for him. Thank you very much from the Ghana Commission for Niasco. We also have the National Universities Commission, Nigeria, uh, I believe join us virtually. Coming yes. here from uh, Dr. Mayaki. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much. Can you hear me? Thank you. I can hear you. We can hear you. Oh, oh great. Um, thank you very much, uh, moderator. Uh, let me uh, very quickly uh, acknowledge uh, His Excellency Arikana Chihombori. Uh, and then to also uh, acknowledge uh, very quickly uh, our dear Professor uh, Olushola Oyole, uh, Secretary General of the AAU. Um, and then uh, to also acknowledge uh, His Excellency Abdurrahman uh, Diallo uh, of the UNESCO com country uh, uh, you know, office in Ghana and for uh, displaying such uh, intellectual uh, an outstanding credibility and very poetic uh, credibility. I'd like to especially uh, congratulate and recognize uh, Professor uh, Abena Busia, uh, Ghana's ambassador to uh, uh, Brazil. Uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, uh, I consider it a distinct uh, honor and a huge uh, privilege to have been invited uh, to deliver uh, the warm felicitations and the goodwill of the National Universities Commission of Nigeria. Uh, and by extension, uh, the goodwill of the 219 universities that currently make up uh, the Nigerian University uh, space, you know, on the occasion of the World uh, Conference on Education and uh, Restitution 2022. We congratulate uh, Professor uh, Oyewole and his uh, formidable team at the AAU Secretariat. Uh, for providing credible and uh, creative leadership and for spearheading the reinvention and the decolonization of African curriculum and African history. I also consider the theme of this uh, conference, uh, the past, the present, and the future 
Afrofuturism and Africa's development, very crucial, very timely, uh, very compelling, uh, because we need to constantly uh, remind ourselves as Nigerians and as Africans, by extension, of the progress being made uh, towards reclaiming and recont recontextualizing our own narratives, our identities, our shared heritage, and those uh, hidden treasures, I dare say, and possibilities and potentials to be found in our past, in our present, and what the future holds for Africa and for Africans. On a day like this, we are reminded that the past is in the eyes of the present and more so uh, for the future. We are also reminded about the principal goal of education, which is the pursuit of knowledge production and those intrinsic values which we are constantly developing in the learner that in an innovative mindset, that ability to realize uh, his or her own potentials. The reason why distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the African Union rolled out a 10 year continental education strategy uh, for Africa to deliver on the essentials of the African human capital. Uh, this the implication being that uh, Africa, uh, or that education and training systems in Africa must as a matter of deliberate uh, policy, meet the knowledge, competencies, skills, innovation, and creativity that is required to nurture African core values and promote sustainable development at the national, sub-regional, and continental levels. In line with the vision of the African Union that I alluded to, the Nigerian National Universities Commission as a regulatory agency uh, responsible for the orderly uh, development of university education in Nigeria uh, continues to advocate uh, for the creation of strategies that align with institutional priorities from increased access and equity to critical thinking and advancing knowledge through research, through quality assurance, through monitoring and evaluation policies, through enhanced uh, ICT uh, transfer, effective guidance and counseling, and those uh, concomitant, including graduate employability that we need, including revision of policies, among others, to reflect emerging issues that impact and continue to impact on Africa. Uh, in spite of the subsistent challenges, we are constantly push, pushing the frontiers to improve the visibility of you know, African universities and strategically you know, setting uh, university ed education on a pedestal for global relevance and competitiveness. Uh, and then we are also uh, currently at the NUC undertaking some uh, legacy uh, you know, programs to reposition uh, uh, university education. For example, the NUC has just consummated uh, its guidelines on transnational education. We believe that uh, we cannot continue to operate as an autarky. Uh, as a university system, we need to uh, open up and uh, we've just brought together these uh, guidelines of international education so that we can, uh, as a university system, you know, uh, uh, begin to uh, open up, uh, open up uh, the, the, the space for foreign uh, investors to come into uh, Nigeria. We've also just, uh, uh, you know, re-engineered our curriculum uh, in such a way that we have uh, ensured that uh, we have, uh, you know, infused uh, those, uh, you know, uh, 21st century employability uh, skills. Uh, the National Investors Commission is proud to say that uh, we, our, uh, you know, uh, you know, flagship program, which we target the linkages with experts and academics, wherein we uh, targeted uh, experts and academics of Nigerian extraction to come back home on a short-term basis, you know, to contribute uh, through the tripod. Uh, you know, functions of teaching, research, and community action is one that we should uh, continue to look at. In that uh, transnational education guidelines that we alluded to, we invite the world to come to Nigeria to uh, establish branch campuses, uh, to, to, you know, undertake uh, training programs, and to uh, establish uh, mergers and teaching institutions that uh, they so desire, you know, in line with our extant uh, policies. Uh, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, we are, no doubt, we are in no doubt about the prevailing challenges in our higher education system, but there are opportunities which, if we properly harness, will ultimately impact other sectors. As Africans, we must constantly uh, heed the clarion call 
to move Africa and Africans from the peripheries to take them to the center, to take our pride of place in the global scheme of events. We need to fix, we need to transform, we need to make our educational system relevant. We need to continue to encourage our universities as all the previous speakers alluded to, to strive towards being truly a universal entities wherein all the attributes and international characteristics, including good reputation and academic credibility become a way of life. By way of conclusion, it is my solemn uh, prayer that during the course of these two or three days, uh, stakeholders and the African inter intelligentsia alike will be able to exchange insights and glean the, those best practices and experiences which will resonate our common goals and aspirations towards the unification and the rapid uh, development of Africa through education, through our rich culture and our shared heritage. Once again, we thank you from the National Universities Commission for this uh, uh, invitation, with which all participants are a most productive and a most uh, rewarding uh, outing. And I said, uh, warm welcome and uh, thank you very much. And good afternoon from Nigeria, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Chris Moyaki from the National Investors Commission, Nigeria. We will now take from the Francophone University Agency, uh, AUF, West Africa. All right, put your hands together for the representative. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Laurent Ilboudou. Uh, I'm from the University Agence of uh, Francophonie, uh, the Association of uh, French-speaking universities. Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I am very happy to join you at this international conference on education and restitution. I would like to thank the organizers, in particular, Professor Oluzola Oyewele, Secretary General of the Association of uh, African Universities for inviting me. I recently met Professor Oyewili and we had interesting conversation on how our two institutions can collaborate for a harmonized and dynamic African higher education and research space. The University Agency of Francophonie that I represent is an association that brings together more than 1,000 French-speaking universities and research centers in Africa and around the world. In Africa, the network has 400 members in 40 countries. We plead and we advocate for more synergies between African universities and uh, uh, research centers, regardless of the languages they speak, French, English, Arabic, Portuguese, and so forth. This important conference is therefore timely. It constitutes, I hope, the prelude to a dynamic cooperation between the stakeholders here present, interested in rebuilding strong and harmonized education systems in Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, I wish you all very fruitful and useful conversation. Once again, I accept my congratulations. Thank you for your kind attention. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much for your your kind words, good word message, and we'll take the second welcoming address uh, from Honorable Kojoyanka, represented by Professor Pachatinobin. Put your hands together for him as he makes his way up. Thank you. Professor Kojoyanka is not able to come to this session yet, but he will join us later. So I will share with you a statement that he has written. 
the worldwide demand for equity, social justice, and the right to self-determination, particularly among people of African descent, compels us to continue with the dialogue on what the future holds in store for our children and children's children. We have an obligation to reclaim the kind of education that tells the truth about our origins, our rich cultural heritage, our people's achievements, as well as our people's expectations. Our collaboration with the Association of African Universities, UNESCO, and others is a manifestation of our collective desire to see a fundamental change in the way we look into the future with optimism, hope, purpose, and determination. The discussions we shall hold at this conference are only a slice of the bigger picture. On our part, as Pan-African Heritage World Museum, we pledge to share the deliberations with our chapters throughout the world as well as make them reference material in both of our digital and physical spaces. It is with great enthusiasm that I welcome you all on behalf of our executive council and the international board to this very important international conference. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Patterson Oben. And we have as a local, I can add it, say Sankofa Yechi. Going back for it isn't wrong. I left out one last uh, good message from um, Professor Silver. So kindly uh, from Dr. Joseph Silver, sorry. Greetings. I'm Dr. Joseph A. Silver Sr. and I'm chair of the Pan-African Heritage World Museum International Board. On behalf of the board, I bring you greetings as you begin this wonderful conference. The Association of African Universities, the Pan-African Heritage World Museum, UNESCO, under the auspices of the Ghana government and the African Union, is bringing this special diaspora conference. The conference is entitled, The Present and the Future afrofuturism and African development. It takes a lot of energy and a lot of people to put this conference on. So we had other collaborating partners such as Panifest, uh, the Ghana National House of Chiefs, the Ghana Cultural Forum, uh, the Aspera African Forum, the African Private Sector Summit, Global Institute of Planning and Sustainability, and the All African Student Union. All these groups came together to make sure that you would have this conference. I wanna thank Professor Passion Obin for leading this charge along with his team to get us to where we are today. So over the next two days, you will be in conference looking at a real purpose for the future. The joint conference aims to reclaim and to recontextualize African education, technology, politics, history, arts, culture, music, spirituality, all in a conscious effort of unification and the rapid development of Africa. I'm a firm believer that Africans must tell their own stories. If they leave it to the Western world, a lot will be left out. And it would always be something less than. This conference is an attempt to reclaim, if you will, the importance of Africans telling their own story. Attending this conference will be scholars from around the world, artists, political and economic influences and decision makers, and practitioners from all over Africa and the diaspora. And they will be focusing on three broad areas. The first area is addressing the prerequisites for the implementation of the African free trade zone. The second one would be rethinking education toward achieving an African renaissance. 
And the third will be reclaiming and reconceptualizing African art, culture, and heritage. Within these three topics, over the next two or three days, we will have a great discussion that will bring the African nations together and move us forward. I'm asking that we not only have a discussion, but we have a platform for forward action to make sure that those things that are talked about during this conference will be fully implemented. Again, have a great conference. Congratulations to all of you. Thank you. So we can do it again for Dr. Joseph Silva for his good whole message to the World Conference on Education and Restitution. At this moment, I would invite His Excellency Abdurrahman Diallo, UNESCO Country Representative Ghana for the keynote address. Put your hands together for him. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Aj Ajeman Okire Darko. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Madam Chair, Her Excellency Arikana Chiombori, my dear sister Ambassador Abin Abuzia, Ambassador to Brazil, but not only to Brazil, 12 countries in Latin America, <laughs> 12, we have 11 other countries, you know, so. <laughs> Professor Olu Shola Oyewole, uh, Director of uh, African uh, Association of Universities. Honorable Professor Yonka, I know you're following us on, uh, online. Uh, dear Professor Pachington Obeng, dear guest participant present here uh, online uh, in the conference room, and those online, I see that there are more than 100 uh, uh, followers online. So, uh, good afternoon, and uh, I wish to thank all of them for their presence and mobilization. Bon après-midi, salam alaikum. Buenos tardes, uh, Jumbo, just to use the African uh, official, African, uh, uh, African Union languages. Uh, I, I, I miss maybe the, we yes, Arabic. Salam alaikum. Salam alaikum. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, it's a privilege really for me to be here with you on the occasion of this uh, World Conference on Education and Restitution to speak about issues that are very central to the UNESCO mission and very contemporary issues. I would like to begin first by expressing my deepest appreciation to the Association of African Universities and Pan-African Heritage World Museum for bringing this important conference into existence, partnering with UNESCO the United Nations Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, your organization. I will speak on behalf of your institution, UNESCO, but from time to time, I will speak more. I will say beyond, I will speak as citizen from Niger, an African and a citizen of the world. So the part will be the institutional message and uh, sometime maybe I will speak uh, from my heart also as, uh, as, uh, as, as an African. And I'm really very happy to be here with a lot of esteemed uh, elders and uh, very specialists. I wish to recognize my uh, elder brother, uh, uh, Nikwate, who is here, uh, one of uh, the fervent and uh, uh, advocate really of the restitution agenda. You all know about his, uh, the legendary 
uh, uh, documentary, You Hide Me, You Hide Me on the Restitution, the, uh, a very famous uh, documentary, which is always used as a school, uh, really, to tell about uh, the, the agenda of restitution. Uh, both AAU and Pan-African Heritage Museum have a long-standing cooperation with UNESCO and uh, has um, uh, just a few months ago, UNESCO had the pleasure to be present at the launch of the digital version of the Pan-African World Heritage Museum on the occasion of uh, 5th May, African World Heritage Day. AAU, AAU can, cannot but be a partner of UNESCO, has the operational arm of uh, the AU Commission uh, for the implementation of the CESA, the Continental Education Strategy 2025, for the higher education component. We cannot but be behind you and support you in your daily work to ensure that the higher education keep its place in the education on SDG4. We know that it's a fight at global level because not all the regions still keep higher education at the same level but we are behind you to ensure that the AU Vision 2063 is implemented uh, through you in the 20, uh, 55 countries of the continent. Uh, just to remind that on 24 January, last January, UNESCO and you, AAU, and other partners, we convened the global celebration of the World Day for African and Afro-descendant culture uh, here in Ghana, and that uh, celebration stimulated an intellectual, an intellectual discourse around themes around, relevant to both Africans and people African descent, namely the incorporation of African history and culture in education, the intangible heritage as levers for the transmission of history and reconciliation. So I'm very pleased that we'll be able to revisit some of these critical topics over the next three days uh, during the conference education and restitution and in my specific contribution that I've been tasked uh, to present the past, the present and the future Afrofuturism and African uh, development. In uh, thinking about uh, how a future can be brought forth from a complex past and present, we shall explore the contest of Afrofuturism. I must uh, disclose that I, I was not aware of that concept, that Afrofuturism, that it was a, a, a literary genre in uh, writings, in music. I used to enjoy it, I consume it <laughs> through music, through, but I didn't know that it was that contest conceptualized. And it's when I was reading the draft that my colleagues prepared for me that I went and explore and learn about that concept Afrofuturism. So uh, to understand uh, Afrofuturism, we must have uh, an understanding, of course, of its history, its meaning, its aspiration, and the desire that comes. Afrofuturism is a concept that stems from a place of aspirational creativity and how that creativity can drive an inclusive future for Africans and the Afro-descendant diaspora. As a concept and more importantly, a powerful ID. It's rooted in a place where being black is ultimately celebrated in an ontological context. However, however we cannot Imagine the future of Africa and its diaspora without restoring its history and revisiting what has been told about its very complex and intricate, intricate past. Until now, or until recent years, let's say the story of Africa had, has been told by outsiders who have been guided by uh, various economic, socio-political, and religious interests. In revisiting this past, UNESCO, your organization was tasked by the African member state. You remember, just after the independence uh, from 57 to the 60s, 54 countries join UNESCO and take their seats around the table, the international conversation on education, sciences, and culture. And from the onset 
from the first speeches. And it's very interesting and very pleasant to hear the, the speeches, the big speeches, les grandes voix de l'UNESCO at that time. And when you can hear uh, Amadou Ampateba from Mali, who's telling us that a year ago, he was in the French delegation uh, working in Ifan. And the next year, he was representing his country, the new independent Mali. And all these countries from the uh, onset really ask the institutional, the scientific, the educational organization to help them, to help them revisit the history, to rewrite the narrative, to rewrite their history. That's how UNESCO embarked in a gigantic uh, 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 work uh, with uh, this flagship program, the General History of Africa. Uh, UNESCO uh, is supporting through this project countries to reclaim ownership over the narration of their own history and to revive their cultural ident identities to foster a shared aspiration to achieve African unity. And uh, the general history of Africa was uh, uh, finished uh, at the end of the 80s. It was there. We have big eight volumes on the history of Africa. So I, I can join um, the professor when he said, let's stop lamenting, <laughs> let's stop lamenting. This story was rewritten and ready in the 70s, in the 80s, and in some of the shelves, and even translated in a lot of African uh, a country in Hausa and Swahili in Fulani, etc. So it was done. The work was done and it was requested by the member states. And the UN institution, UNESCO, did it, assisted the member states. So before 2000, you had this story on the shelves and with commitment from headquarters in quoras, member states say that they will commit to integrate it in the curricula. But we know where we are. Uh, today uh, uh, in 20, 2022, there's a lot, there's a lot to do. There was a second phase of the general history of Africa. Initially, there were eight volumes. Uh, there was the pedagogical use of the general history of Africa. This uh, second phase really, which transformed the scientific, the first scientific eight volumes into pedagogical uh, content that countries could take and integrate in their uh, uh, curriculum. Uh, but that was in the, in the early 2000s. Uh, there were a lot of African Union summits uh, during which uh, well, member states, head of states committed, committed, committed to uh, uh, include uh, the general history of Africa in, uh, in their... Uh, in curricula. Remember particularly Khartoum in 2006, uh, that was the uh, special summit devoted to education and culture. During that summit, the key, um, the key uh, blueprints in education and culture were approved by head of state, included the second decade of the education, which then become the CESA, and uh, all the blueprints in culture including the Renaissance Charter, the Cultural Renaissance uh, Charter. And uh, I remember particularly because I was there, uh, the ge then General Director General of UNESCO, the Japanese, offered the 54 head of states, the collection, the eight volumes on the table, just symbolically to show that the scientific organization produce the scientific content, deliver it, handed it over to the head of states to, uh, to do their work, to share it in their country. At that time for Ghana, uh, President John Kufour was at that, at that summit. So the story was, we're gonna keep on saying the story was told, was told, was it, it's there, it's there. It's uh, on the shelves and now it's uh, on digital. It's available. So uh, we have the story. So this is a contribution of UNESCO and of course UNESCO wants to continue to support the member states. And recently, lastly, at the General Conference of UNESCO, uh, General History of Africa, the integration was considered as one of the flagship uh, priority Africa for the eight, for the eight coming uh, uh, years. 
So it's it's in the hand of uh, the, the, the countries, the civil societies, uh, the, the the education fraternity to reclaim and to use it and to digest it and to share it uh, with uh, with the with the young, the present, and 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 the future generation. Uh, as part of its uh, its uh, provision, its uh, offer of uh, of uh, of. Uh, 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 um, uh, content beside the general history of Africa, UNESCO has these uh, uh, the roots, the program of the roots of enslaved peoples project. Before we used to call it the slave, the uh, the slave roots uh, project, and this year the name changed to roots of enslaved peoples project, just to respect. We don't, we don't born, we don't uh, uh, slave, we become slave. So the program is called now the Roots of the Slave People. And this program, which is predicated on the idea that ignorance or concealment of major historical events constitute an obstacle to mutual understanding, reconciliation, and cooperation among peoples. Some believe a lot of focus has been devoted to the topic of slavery and that it is time to turn this page of history. Some believe that a lot of focus has been devoted. Do you think so? Do you share that, uh, that uh, 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 understanding? We are here in Ghana, we are not in any place, but what, how many places do you have? How many museums do you have on slavery? Uh, I've been here in Ghana for three years and a half. Uh, and a half. There are Two, I visited the one which was in Cape Coast Museum. There was a museum. And now there is a museum at Usher Fort, uh, Usher Fort, uh, um, uh, which is one of uh, the 28 Fort and Castle along the shore, which is part of, which are part of the Fort and Castle World Heritage Site. So there's a small museum on slavery. So can we say that we did a lot about there's still a lot, a lot, a lot to discover, to document, and to share. So, uh, as I say, something that it, a lot of was been has been done, and uh, that it was time to turn the page. But the UNESCO program, the roots of enslaved peoples, demonstrate why. I have some water. <coughs> Drink some water. This program demonstrates, thank you, thank you. It demonstrates why and how exploring this strategy can help us to establish the link between a tragic past, thank you, a complex present and the future to be created together. Last week, the International Day for the Remembrance of the Slave Trade and its Abolition, which is celebrated every 23rd August, served as a reminder of the need to educate people about the true history of Africa, correct misconception and stereotypes, and remind ourselves of the rich and diverse shared heritage of the African people in the continent and across the diaspora. Ladies and gentlemen, in uh, establishing this link between that past and the future we aspire to, Af that we aspire to, Afrofuturism serves as the fulcrum for such intricate ideas. Afrofuturism means taking ideas, culture, language, shared histories, and examine them through an Afrocentric lens in a forward-thinking manner. How does one look through a multitude of African and diaspora ideas, cultures, and languages comprehensively? It requires a unique sense of understanding of what it means to be African and Black, and accompanied with a keen sense of imagination. Imagination, which is a powerful tool for expressing creativity in that futuristic context, a context stripped of negative perception and focused on a positive reimagination re re of the global black experience. The rich intangible cultural heritage 
is instrumental in Afrofuturistic ideas. And Afrofuturistic will take our vibrant Kente that you all know from Ghana, will merge it with uh, uh, an exuberant Gele from uh, Nigeria, or use uh, some of the Bubus from Senegal or Mali. And uh, let's think, let us think in 200 years from now, what would uh, it mean to be fashionable and African? What would office wear would like? Look, would look like? What would stress wear, street wear look like? The wealth of knowledge and skills transmitted through intangible cultural heritage from one generation to the next is central to the reimagination of an Afrocentric version of the future. And UNESCO is committed to safeguarding it. UNESCO, through one of its convention, which is called the 2003 Convention for the Safeguarding of intangible heritage assist support member states to uh, document, uh, to recognize, and uh, can, uh, they can recognize it uh, internationally to get recognized those intangible uh, uh, um, knowledges uh, that are uh, goes from oral traditions, firm performing arts, rituals, social practices, festive events, traditional craftsmanship, etc. Here in Ghana, we have many living expressions such as the high life mu uh, music, uh, the Adoa, Ado you call it the Adoa dance, uh, the Adinkra and Ga or Ewe symbols, and the traditional mastery of the she butter in the north, the traditional herbal medicines, the earthenware pottery making, uh, the practice around the Ashanti traditional building, just to mention a few, there's a lot, there's a lot, and it has not yet been exploited. And a roadmap has just started here in Ghana under the leadership of uh, the National Folklore Board and of course the Ministry of Tourism, Art and Culture and other stakeholders. Afrofuturism was born out of a time when being African and Afro-descendant often meant great distress arising from colonialism slavery in a time where it was difficult to imagine individuals of African descent aspiring to greatness outside the perception of reality. To the futurist, the goal was to deconstruct social perception of what it meant to be black and visualize a time beyond the oppressive structure and repressions of culture, language, and shared history. These futurists imagined a time where there would be a collective consciousness about what it means to retrace our roots and be able to say, I am home. In advancement of this aspiration, the United Nations designates specific days, weeks, years, and decades as occasions in order to promote through awareness and action the objectives of the organization tomorrow it is the International Day for People of African Descent. And until 2024, the International Decade for People of African Descent, which started in 2015. These commemorations recognize and highlight the contribution of the African diaspora that sadly often go unnoticed. They also serve has reminders of the cruel inhumanity of the transatlantic slave trade in the past and the dangers of racism, prejudice, and racial discrimination today. Furthermore, they exist to advocate for the full enjoyment of the economic, social, cultural, civil, and the political rights of people of African descent and their effective and equal participation in society. We commend in this regard the Ghana uh, initiative of the year of return in 2019 and the year uh, and the beyond the return uh, decade. And of course, we have uh, uh, several festivals such as Panafest, which contribute also in advancing to this aspiration. To further understand Afrofuturism, we must look at its evolution that takes into consideration not just our history of colonialism and slavery, but also a time before the transatlantic slave trade, 
we must ask ourselves, how, what did African cultures look like? What were our stories? How would our cultures and stories have evolved without the interference? How can our ideology serve as a guide for cultural growth? In thinking about how Afrofuturism could drive storytelling and the preservation of our language and histories of the African and larger Afro-descendant diaspora, there are examples such as a festival in Ghana like Afrochela or Chaliwuti, uh, festival which are tools for Afrofuturistic ideas to flourish, as well as uh, the blockbuster uh, Black um, Panther. In uh, Black Panther, in that, music, uh, in that uh, movie, futuristic fiction was skillfully melded with indigenous storytelling and representation of African art and projected on a global scale with incredible success from the use of Nzibidi symbols, which were, has, was derived from Nigeria to the use of the garments of the Maasai people in Kenya, the headdress of the Zulu people of South Africa and Kente generally recognized as coming from Ghana. The movie is a successful example of Afrofuturism. So if Afrofuturism Afro can be used in the uh, cultural and creative ex expression and to remind our story and help the young generation in, in particular to reconnect to their past through that uh, fiction, yes, yes, let's, let's opt and, 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 and encourage further use uh, of the, the African arts and history in this kind of uh, 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 creative and cultural expressions. In further representation of Afrofuturism through film, Netflix and UNESCO launched a groundbreaking competition in 2021 entitled African Folk Tales Reimagined to find some of Sub-Saharan Africa's up and coming filmmakers staying true to the competition's aim of uh, showcasing Africa's rich cultural heritage the short films will feature reimagined African folk tales presented in multiple African languages. Six film makers were chosen and are currently in the development phase for their project before starting production on the short uh, films that will eventually premiere on Netflix as part of an anthology of African folk tales later this year. Afrofuturistic ideas can also be expressed through writing and storytelling. Very soon, here in Ghana, in Accra, the city of Accra will uh, take on the mantle as the next UNESCO World Book Capital from April 23 to April 24. Accra will be the heart of the world for the book industry and, and, and reading. Uh, looking to the next generation of artists from uh, Africa and the Afro-descendant diaspora, there is so much to draw inspiration from, and it's important we lay the groundwork for emergent works to succeed. Accra hosting the Nest Book Capital will enable these writers and enthusiasts to promote their Afro futuristic ideas. Their success is vital for the growth of cultural pride and the promotion of a successful African future through the medium of art, music, language, dance, spiritually and other forms of expression. Furthermore, in uh, protecting these ideas and the practitioner of these ideas, UNESCO adopted the recommendation concerning the status of the artist uh, which calls upon member states to improve the professional, social, and economic status of artists through the implementation of policies and measures related to training, social security, employment, and tax conditions, in particular for self-employed artists. So ladies and gentlemen, past, present, future, Afrofuturism and Africa development. Yes, Afrofuturism can and inspire us, Afrofuturism can be a catalytic genre we can use that can promote 
Afrofuturism has an enabler, a contributor to heal, to reconcile, to help to do the Sankofa journey. The global theme of this conference uh, is education and restitution. I have not addressed the key issue of restitution. There will be a specific session where UNESCO will tell you about what you member state, the member state gave them the responsibility to do on that agenda, and particularly as custodian of uh, the UNESCO 1970 Convention on the Means of Prohibiting and Preventing the Illicit Import, Export, and Transfer of Ownership of Cultural Property. This is uh, a convention which helps the countries to, uh, for the restitutions and uh, which also provide an international platform for cooperation between the countries because it's a long process of negotiation when you start when a country uh, wants uh, and reclaim its uh, its uh, cultural objects we can uh, witness we are witnessing the successful and promising uh, processes in the ECOWAS regions in Nigeria with Germany, you are following uh, the return of the bronzes uh, in Benin uh, uh, from, the, uh, from the Benin uh, region. And uh, you also witness the return of cultural objects in uh, Benin, uh, Cotonou in Benin, and uh, the one also in Senegal and Mali. Congratulations to this country. And we are aware uh, also that here in Ghana, the process started and uh, there are some member, members of the group who are working uh, on their uh, roadmap. So restitution, you cannot do restitution without education. That's why, well, Professor, you put education and restitution. It's not just a matter to bring back or to, uh, to, to reclaim what for and on the name of who and, and how have we prepared uh, the, 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 the welcoming so it's all about education. It's all about education to tell them, to tell about the, 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 uh, what it was, uh, and what, where those connection, this interaction that existed before so that the welcoming be well prepared also and that there will be a real and, 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 and full ownership uh, by uh, the citizen uh, uh, who will welcome uh, back their artifacts. So education is at the heart for, uh, of this exercise in the, no, in the formal space and in the non-formal space. No, let's not forget the non-formal space. This is there that we need uh, the support also of the expressive, expressive arts, the music, the storytellers to speak to all the audience and, and particularly the youth. Professor, I couldn't but mention, you know that the UN Secretary General is convening next September, the Transforming Education Summit, convening the whole world, all the member states, the UN to come and discuss, and countries will come and commit, each one, individual will commit, and there will be global commitment. There have been tracks of discussion around safety, health education, uh, skills, uh, teaching issues, digital financing, but I will say that one was not transpiring culture, history, contents, and it should talk, speak uh, uh, for Africa. I, I, I'm sure and I expect that Africa had a position and put an emphasis on the content. Yes, digital, Let, yes, uh, safety, yes, uh, uh, skills, but content. What do you put in the content, the, 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 the cultural prism? What do you put in that? And that is, 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 is a continental priority. I'm sure that uh, the, 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 the leaders will express and, 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 and will share and commit uh, to address it. Ladies and gentlemen, I was very long, but I took this opportunity being here in uh, this uh, prestigious place platform with AAU, speaking to all the universities uh, on the continent and all these audience. Uh, let me take again the opportunity to thank all the collaborators in this event, 
which uh, which we've adopted will contribute to the realization of the UN 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, as well as the African Union Agenda 2063. In furtherance of this goal, I commend Ghana and other African countries that have ratified the AU Charter for African Cultural Renaissance, which calls for the rehabilitation and restoration of our vibrant African cultural heritage. We also encourage others that are yet to do so to expedite action. So just to close, Professor, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you warmly for your attention, for your patience. And uh, I wish uh, all of us a fruitful conference, but stay assured, stay assured of the availability of UNESCO. This is your organization. 55 countries are members of UNESCO. They are full member states, they are contributing fully. So we are here to support you and we'll be here to support your agenda. So do not hesitate, come to us uh, and, and remind us it regularly and we'll be there. Thank you very much for your attention. Medasi. Thank you, His Excellency Abdul Rahman. Diallo for your keynote address. And we will take a poetry and rhyme from Del Lu, African University College of Communication. Put your hands up for Del Lu as she makes a way for poetry recital. Hello, everyone. So this poem is from David Diop. Please. Africa, my Africa. Africa of proud warriors in ascensuous savannas. Africa of whom my grandmother sings on the banks of the distant river. I have never known you, but your blood flows through my veins. Your beautiful black blood that irrigates the fields. The blood of your sweat, the sweat of your work, the work of your slavery. Africa, tell me Africa, is this your back that is unbent? This back that never breaks under the weight of humiliation. This back trembling with the red scars and saying no to the whip under the mid sun, the midday sun. But a grave voice answers me, impetuous child, that tree, young and strong, that tree over there, splendidly alone amidst the white and faded flowers, that is your Africa springing anew, springing up patiently, obstinately, whose fruit bit by bit acquires the bitter taste of liberty. Thank you. That was apt and Saxon. Thank you very much, Delu, for your poetry recital. And now I would have to invite again Professor Olushola Oyewele, Secretary General for the Association of African Investors, to give us a closer remarks. And afterwards, we'll have our photograph, good photograph. So put your hands together for Professor Olushola Oyewele as he makes his way here for the closer remarks. Kindly. I will really not say it's a closing remark because we are just beginning. But to let you know that we really appreciate all our guests, especially those who came from other countries and beyond Africa. This conference will not be holding today without the support of all the other partners that are involved in this. Really, when the World Heritage Museum, uh, led by Honorable Kujo Yanka, came to AU to inform us about the, the, their vision for such a meeting as this, we were very eager to concur with them, to let them know that we are into this too. 
and little did we realize too that we have a brother in, in Ambassador Dialo, who we were sure that just getting to him, he will surely support us. We want to appreciate you for your support and the opportunity to work with you. Really, I'm looking forward to the UNESCO, uh, to the UN Conference on Education coming up in October, and which I know is being coordinated by UNESCO. Ladies and gentlemen, we may just be few numbers here, but in the next many hours, our brothers and sisters all over the world will be part of this. And what we are saying here, we are speaking to the world, but not just to the world, we are speaking to the future of Africa. It's high time we think, it's high time we take appropriate action. I want to thank you for being part of this. And I want to also specially thank my sister, the ambassador of Ghana to Brazil and to so many other countries. We really enjoy your poetry. And really, I've just decided that I will have to look out for the books of your father and gain some wisdom from those elders. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming to AAU. And for all the universities in Africa connected to this, you can see that we have a work to do together to think about the future of Africa. Please, let's get involved. Thank you once again. I know that this is just the opening session. We still have one more, one session to go today before we resume again tomorrow. Thank you for coming to AAU. I need to apologize to you and to everybody that beyond this, I will be connecting online too, as I need to be in Morocco to make another presentation on behalf of universities in Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Lucio Oyewole, uh, SG for AAU. Thank you so much for your statement. And we'll now move on to our group photograph that will be taken here. So I would ask kindly that we all make our way to the stage. Uh, special guests um, on the first floor and also invited guests will join together to make our way on the photograph. We wanted to go outside, but the weather isn't so kind. So we would have to make a way and then arrange ourselves by the guidance of our photographer. So we can all rise and then join the special guests up here for a group photograph. Afterwards, we'll make our way for lunch. All invited guests to please make their way up here, everyone. Yes.
find variety of job postings classified by the sectors and profession in looking for a job in higher education institution on the african continent there is no need to go looking the africa education jobs board will deliver available jobs to you via our platform to start your search visit our website on our website you will find variety of job postings classified by the sectors and professions they belong to there are sections devoted to variety of career related materials so we'll be going what for a line with our lunch uh, right up all I information you require will be our lunch means on the job description and requirements are accessible so, on hello. the site if you are looking for a job in higher education on the attention please ladies and gentlemen use our dedicated portal www.edujobs.com for job market update you can follow us on twitter and instagram at okay. af jobs so you'll be ushered to the African Student Voices is a program where we discuss issues pertaining to the welfare and well being of students we'll across Africa's higher education we'll institutions and our society. Just because of the change in society mm -hmm. of late, we have some kind of connection between academia and then the industry. Mm -hmm. You're studying a course like mine, which is very demanding accounting, finance and economics. You know, it's, it's, the course alone is a headache. It's a headache. How much more, you I think, the, you know, the headache of having to think about where, you, where the fee is going to come from. Yeah. On this program, we project the concerns and views of students in Africa on their welfare and well-being in their various institutions. The government is trying every means possible to make yeah. the systems work. Yeah, and that same government that I have entrusted in mm -hmm. is telling me that the payroll is full. Of mm -hmm. course, I'm trying to ask you. We also empower students to be informed and responsible future leaders of Africa and also educate the youth of Africa on Africa's developmental blueprints and strategies. Schools can collaborate with institutions okay. to, to, to provide you know seminars for students, mm -hmm. job fairs yeah. for students to learn, to, to equip students to get ready for the job market. Join me on the African Student Voices program this and every Friday at exactly 2 p.m. as I engage with students on the issue issues affecting them and the way forward. I am your host Jemima Adaladem Duche. You can also follow us on our social media handles, Association of African Universities on Facebook and YouTube, AAUTV underscore African Universities on Twitter and AAUTV official on Instagram. Hello Africa, you're welcome to AgroLink on AAUTV. on the continent. The African 
African Union defines the African diaspora as consisting of people of native African origin living outside of the continent, irrespective of their citizenship and nationality, and who are willing to contribute to the development of the continent and the building of the African Union. In recognition of the enormous contribution of the diaspora to the continent, the Association of African Universities rolled out a program, Diaspora Connect, to identify and produce impactful interviews and documentaries that showcase the contributions of the African academics in the diaspora to institutions of higher learning in Africa. This program is partly funded by the Carnegie Corporation of New York. Featured on Diaspora Connect are fellows and hosts under the Carnegie African Diaspora Fellowship Program funded by the Carnegie Corporation of New York. Also featured on Diaspora Connect are coverages that showcase the recontextualization of African technology, art and culture towards the unification and rapid development of the continent. The diasporas are ready and willing to engage in meaningful thought and imagination that can guide the continent's efforts for emancipation, innovation and recreation. And Africa is ready for its sixth region. Follow us on our social media platforms on Facebook and YouTube at Association of African Universities and on Twitter at AAU underscore African Universities as well as on our dedicated website at tv.aau.org. Hello, welcome to Health Afric, the health show that enlightens you about stigmatized health problems and educates you on trending and unique health concerns and challenges. This is a show where we bring on board experts with experience and specialization in health to educate us through interviews, experiments and health conferences. It also interacts with you by allowing you to submit health-related questions for our guests to respond and explain. Is that Don't forget so to follow us on all our social media channels African to stay up to date on the program to the at the Association of, of African world. Universities and on Facebook and YouTube, AAUT. And the people world we made don't know it because our history has been suppressed. And that's why I'm excited to be a part of things like the... the Pan African Heritage Museum. Very excited that now, and that that's why, as an academic, I think. good things came from the West. It's, it's simply not true. We know it and they know it, or at least they knew it until they decided to deliberately forget. Um, just a side issue, for example, I was very struck a couple of years ago when COVID came mm -hmm. that suddenly people started talking about the fact that vaccinations, the use of a minuscule amount of the disease mm -hmm. injected into the body can actually cure the body yeah. is a therapy that came from Africa, from oh, West wow. Africa, <laughs> you know, yeah. and they knew it and chose to forget about it. Yeah. So, um, so that's the negative side. This, as a teacher, we need to tell the story differently. The positive side is what we're doing now. What does that mean for us? How can we unite? How can we claim the things that we share and have in common and wish to do together and trans continue to transform the world, continue to sh shape the world, but continue to shape the world in ways that we want, we control and we have power over. You know, so yeah. that's why I'm passionate about what I do. Okay, beautiful. You, you did mention that uh, Africans need to tell our story. Now, these conferences are basically focused on Africa's development. And so telling your story from the past, how does that contribute to our development in the future? You know, I always find that a very surprising question. And I'll give an analogy. 
Have you ever met a person with amnesia who has lost their memory or cannot remember anything? No, I'm not sure. How do we as human beings generally behave when we meet people who can't remember? Even in ordinary conversation, you're talking to a friend about something you did together and they can't remember it, you get frustrated. Yeah. We recognize that it is not normal not to remember your past as an individual. Why do we think it's okay for a whole collectivity of people not to remember their past? The same kind of disequilibrium that happens when an individual cannot remember something they've done or taken part in is magnified manifold when you have whole collectivities who are disconnected from who they were and what they've done. So for me, that's a question that shouldn't even be asked. And, you know, one of the things I frequently tell my students is there's a reason why imperialists take away people's language. The first thing people who start empires and conquer you do is to say, you must learn our language. That's a positive way of putting it. What they're also saying is you must take, we will take away yours because they know if they take away your language, they take away your sense of who you are and what you do and who you've been. And if they succeed in doing that, they don't need to jail the politicians. They, they get rid of your poets and you can leave the politicians be because they will do whatever you want because they've forgotten their own stories. And that's dangerous. Sure. Thank you very much. Clearly, it is not normal to forget about your past. Thank you very much, Her Excellency. Uh, we'll be taking uh, the next interview, but we'll be right back. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, please, I'll have you introduce yourself. I am an engineer professor of Dr. Agbodio from Africa Center of Excellence for Sustainable and Power Development, University of Nigeria, Usuka Enugu State. Okay, thank you very much, Paul, for joining us. Now, I believe coming to the event, you, you came in with expectations. I would want to find out if these expectations have been met. Oh, quite sure. The expression has been met almost 100%. What I observe that the, the unity of Africa development can never be overemphasized. Mm -hmm. What I observe that the Africa, you are, are really doing the nice thing. If we have in the Africa University it to focus and to enhance the available resources in Africa to be, overcome the challenges in most of Africa universities in terms of uh, collaborations and the networking that had never been done since, but that, that can be able to lead to the industrial development of the A A AU and the Africa development at large. Okay, so I think I'll dwell on your center of excellence because development, uh, Africa's development, I believe starts from the little corner that you find yourself. So I'd want to find out from you, what's you and your team at your center of excellence have been, I mean, your contributions towards this goal, uh, a goal that we are all looking at, an Africa that would be way, way developed in the future. Yeah, so in my center is uh, Africa Center of Excellence for Sustainable and Power Development. In my center, our main focus is to be able to solve the problem of, of, of a power development mm -hmm. for the South Africa development, if for sustainable power for Africa. Mm -hmm. Our main, main, the most challenges of the African nation today is how to be able to be able to overcome the problem of a challenge of what? Power. Power. Once we are, we are in, my, in my center, we believe. When we are, we are able to over, over, overcome the challenge of uh, power for the Africa development, mm -hmm. Africa will go in the, a long way in terms of uh, development for our world continent. So uh, World, uh, world Bank will able to award that contract for we as a six uh, billion dollars. Just to, to be able to solve one challenges fixing the Africa what 
continent. And uh, lately, uh, we have been able to overcome uh, some of the challenges in a sustainable power for the African continent, for the South Sahara area, for we, we have achieved that. Okay, thank you very much for talking to us, Prof. Uh, thank you so much. And this is still the live coverage of the World Conference on Education and Restitution. My name is Mamiukwa Utwa Kwanyam. We'll be bringing you more interviews. Stay glued to your screens. Culture should accept technology. The barriers and the various factors which sort of limits the full participation of women in fields such as STEM. The aim is to exhibit, to demonstrate the technologies that we have been working with over the years. Your job as a leader is to ensure that you train people who are even better than you are. That's leadership because you would leave one day and you ought to equip people with the skills to take over from you. Looking for a job in higher education institution on the African continent? There is no need to go looking. The Africa Education Jobs Board will deliver available jobs to you via our platform. To start your search, visit our website. On our website, you will find variety of job postings classified by the sectors and professions they belong to. There are sections devoted to variety of career-related materials, as well as information on African countries. All information you require, based on the job description and requirements, are accessible on the site. If you are looking for a job in higher education on the continent, use our dedicated portal www.africa.edujobs.com for job market updates you can follow us on twitter and instagram at af jobs board african student voices is a program where we discuss issues pertaining to the welfare and well-being of students across Africa's higher education institutions and our society. Just because of the change in society mm -hmm. of late, we have some kind of connection between academia and then the industry. Mm -hmm. You're studying a course like mine, which is very demanding, accounting, finance and economics. You know, it's, it's, the course alone is a headache. It's a headache. How much like, more, I think, the, you know, the headache of having to think about where, you, where the fee is going to come from. Yeah. On this program, we project the concerns and views of students in Africa on their welfare and well-being in their various institutions. The government is trying every means possible to make yeah. the systems work. Yeah, and that same government that I have entrusted in mm -hmm. is telling me that the payroll the is full. Of mm -hmm. course, I'm trying to ask you. We also empower students to be informed and responsible future leaders of Africa and also educate the youth of Africa on Africa's development
environmental blueprints and strategies. Schools can collaborate with institutions to, okay. to, to provide you know, seminars for students, mm -hmm. job fairs yeah. for students to learn, to, to equip students to get ready for the job market. Join me on the African Students Voices program this and every Friday at exactly 2 p.m. as I engage with students on the issues affecting them and the way forward. I am your host, Jemima Daladem Duche. You can also follow us on our social media handles, Association of African Universities on Facebook and YouTube, AAUTV underscore African Universities on Twitter, and AAUTV Official on Instagram. Hello, Africa. You're welcome to AgroLink on AAUTV. AgroLink is a program that aims at showcasing and highlighting agricultural activities on the continent. defines the African diaspora as consisting of people of native African origin living outside of the continent irrespective of their citizenship and nationality and who are willing to contribute to the development of the continent and the building of the African Union. In recognition of the enormous contribution of the diaspora to the continent, the Association of African Universities rolled out a program, Diaspora Connect, to identify and produce impactful interviews and documentaries that showcase the contributions of the African academics in the diaspora to institutions of higher learning in Africa. This program is partly funded by the Carnegie Corporation of New York. Featured on Diaspora Connect are fellows and hosts under the Carnegie African Diaspora Fellowship Program funded by the Carnegie Corporation of New York. Also featured on Diaspora Connect are coverages that showcase the recontextualization of African technology, arts and culture towards the unification and rapid development of the continent. The diasporas are ready and willing to engage in meaningful thought and imagination that can guide the continent's efforts for emancipation, innovation and recreation. And Africa is ready for its sixth region. Follow us on our social media platforms on Facebook and YouTube at Association of African Universities and on Twitter at AAU underscore African Universities as well as on our dedicated website at tv.aau.org. Hello, welcome to Health Africa, the health show that enlightens you about stigmatized health problems and educates you on trending and unique health concerns and challenges. This is a show where we bring on board experts with experience and specialization in health to educate us through interviews, experiments and health conferences. It also interacts with you by allowing you to submit health related questions for our guests to respond and explain. Don't forget to follow us on all our social media channels to stay up to date on the program at Association of African Universities on Facebook and YouTube, AAUTV underscore African Universities on Twitter and AAUTV Official on Instagram. Health Africa, your favorite health show in Africa. Vic Johnson in his book Goal Setting, 13 Secrets of Workers Achievers said that you know, to achieve big goals requires you to become a bigger person and you must develop new habits, attitudes, skills and abilities. Welcome to Impact Stories. Which is dedicated to celebrating academic mentors. This program is running on AAU TV. As you apply to that university and you are not admitted, it is not the end of the world and it's not a reason to walk away. It is the reason to, first of all, do an introspection and come to a conclusion that you probably did something wrong. What were your career ambitions as you were going through school? Uh, I said I wanted to be a lawyer. So this black connotation has a negative um, impact outside. But when you meet somebody like Dr. Mensah, you realize that 
the world is our oyster and there is so much we can do as Africans. But it's true they say that if you want to just achieve any goal, it's about you deciding and you believing in yourself, you can do it. Keep watching Impact Stories on AAU TV. Be inspired with our academic mentors. Have a nice day. Welcome to another informative and educative episode of AAU Talks. So on AAU TV, the voice of Education Africa. In terms of culture, that's fine. Except that our culture should accept technology. So the barriers and the various factors which sort of limits the full participation of women in fields such as STEM. The aim is to exhibit, to demonstrate the technologies that we have been working with over the years. Your job as a leader is to ensure that uh, you train people who are even better than you are. That's leadership because you will leave one day and you ought to equip people with the skills to take over from you. Looking for a job in higher education institution on the African continent? There is no need to go looking. The Africa Education Jobs Board will deliver available jobs to you via our platform. To start your search, visit our website. On our website, you will find a variety of job postings classified by the sectors and professions they belong to. There are sections devoted to variety of career-related materials as well as information on African countries. All information you require based on the job description and requirements are accessible on the site. If you are looking for a job in higher education on the continent, use our dedicated portal www.africa.edujobs.com For job market updates, you can follow us on Twitter and Instagram at AFJobsBoard. African Student Voices is a program where we discuss issues pertaining to the welfare and well-being of students across Africa's higher education institutions and our society. Just because of the change in society mm -hmm. of late, we have some kind of connection between academia and then the industry. Mm -hmm. When you're studying a course like mine, which is very demanding, accounting, finance and economics, you know, it's, it's, the course alone is a headache. It's a headache. How much more, you I think, the, you know, the headache of having to think about where, you, where the fee is going to come from. Yeah. On this program, we project the concerns and views of students in Africa on their welfare and well-being in their various institutions. The government is trying every means possible to make yeah. the systems work. Yeah, and that's the same government that I have entrusted in mm -hmm. is telling me that the period the is full. Is of course, I'm trying to ask We also empower students to be informed and responsible future leaders of Africa and also educate the youth of Africa on Africa's developmental blueprints and strategies. Schools can collaborate with institutions to, okay. to, to provide you know seminars for students, mm -hmm. job fairs yeah. for students to learn, to, to equip students to get ready for the job market. Join me on the African Students Voices program this and every Friday at exactly 2 p.m. as I engage with students on the issue issues affecting them and the way forward. I am your host Jimaima Adaladem Doche. You can also follow us on our social media handles, Association of African Universities on Facebook and YouTube, AAUTV underscore African Universities on Twitter and AAUTV official on Instagram. Hello Africa, you're welcome to our link on AAUTV. AgroLink is a program that aims at showcasing and highlights agricultural activities on the continent. The African Union 
defines the African diaspora as consisting of people of native African origin living outside of the continent, irrespective of their citizenship and nationality, and who are willing to contribute to the development of the continent and the building of the African Union. In recognition of the enormous contribution of the diaspora to the continent, the Association of African Universities rolled out a program, Diaspora Connect, to identify and produce impactful interviews and documentaries that showcase the contributions of the African academics in the diaspora to institutions of higher learning in Africa. This program is partly funded by the Carnegie Corporation of New York. Featured on Diaspora Connect are fellows and hosts under the Carnegie African Diaspora Fellowship Program funded by the Carnegie Corporation of New York. Also featured on Diaspora Connect are coverages sexualization of African technology, arts and culture towards the unification and rapid development of the continent. The diasporas are ready and willing to engage in meaningful thought and imagination that can guide the continent's efforts for emancipation, innovation and recreation. And Africa is ready for its sixth region. Follow us on our social media platforms on Facebook and YouTube at Association of African Ba ye tu ye tu ye binguni ye tu ye tu 
wamina baba yetu yetu ye funji na la ko weli tu kuzwe is about to begin and would seek your attention. So we'll kick start with a special documentary uh, by Emerita Professor Sheila Walker, Familiar Faces on Expected Places, a global African diaspora. So, today call team, let's get it rolling as we see this special documentary. Most of the people who laid the foundations of the modern Americas were of African origin. Of the 6.5 million people who crossed the Atlantic during the first 300 of the 500-year history of the modern Americas, only 1 million came from Europe. 5.5 million people were brought from Africa during the inhuman commerce in human lives known as the transatlantic slave trade. Africans enslaved in the Americas were forced to do the work of building the European colonies that became the American republics. Some Africans were selected specifically for their technological expertise. Africans had been working with iron for thousands of years, and their descendants continued to make both useful objects and beautiful works of art. You look around the wall here, this is some of my work in that 72 years. You know, I went in the blacksmith shop to shoe horse. You know, I didn't dream I would be making gifts. African knowledge helped feed the Americas with rice domesticated more than 3,000 years ago in West Africa. U.S. plantation owners asked slave ship captains to bring them skilled rice Negroes. The Portuguese enslaved Africans from what was called the Gold Coast 
to mine gold in Brazil. They said these Africans, whom they called mining Negroes, had an almost magical luck in finding gold. Luck or expertise? Toda a tecnologia empregada aqui na extração do ouro, ela é devido a esse conhecimento africano. Eles precisaram dessa mão de obra especializada. Então eles vão numa região específica da África, que é a região que a gente chama de Costa da Mina, né? E já tinha grandes reinos no passado que faziam uso desse ouro, né? Aí a gente fala do, do reino Achante, né? Do grande reino do Mali também. Não fosse a presença africana, não fosse o saber e o conhecimento trazido pelos africanos, que embora não tenham chegado aqui como mão de obra escravizada, Portugal jamais teria conseguido tirar daqui o volume de ouro que tirou. In Ecuador, descendants of mining Negroes still pan gold and transform it into beautiful creations like those of their African ancestors. By the end of the 19th century, 12 to 15 million Africans had been scattered throughout the Americas. More than 200 million African descendants now live throughout the Americas, some in unexpected places. Los afros ya estamos, estamos visibilizándonos, ¿no? porque obviamente habíamos vivido siempre desde cuando la colonia, pero estábamos como cultos, no, no, no estábamos eh, mostrando nuestra identidad. Pero ahora estamos muy visibilizados ya, en cambio estamos reconocidos por la nueva Comisión Política del Estado, entonces estamos incluidos en, en lo que es eh, Bolivia. Across Africa. People play the game of sophisticated mathematical strategy that in some places is called wari. The game is one of the many elements of their cultures that Africans brought with them to the Americas. Wari is still played in the Caribbean, most prominently on the island of Antigua. I asked the Prime Minister to tell me one thing that Africans in Antigua have something tangible that they have now that they brought from Africa. And a woman shouted out in the crowd, Wari! <laughs> Jawara, who was a math teacher in Antigua, brought his knowledge and skills to the United States. He makes Wari boards and plays and teaches the game on the street in Harlem. Antiguans believe that Wari is their game. Some, some Antiguans believe that there's no other people on earth that plays Wari. <laughs> okay. So, the object of the game is to capture 25 seeds on the opponent's side of the, of, the, of the board. To make a play, you will take all the seeds up from any one of your houses. So take up, make a choice, and you place one seed in the nets and one... Yes, I used to play when I was a child. Yes, absolutely. But it's all over when you go to Africa. It's Everybody in the street, play. It's very common. Ah, you made it, yes, of course. That's why everybody in Africa play this, because it's very smart. Antigua is the only place where the players are buried with this board. When they died, they made sure that they took one of these um, warrior boys to heaven. <laughs>
Almost half of the Africans who arrived in the Americas came from the Central African region of the Kingdom of Congo. And some African diaspora communities perpetuate Congo royal pageantry. For centuries, the Congo Kingdom was respected in the Atlantic world as an African Christian kingdom. Such esteem was reflected in European artists' portrayals of Congo diplomats. Americas, in spite of slavery, African descendants perpetuated memories of royal traditions from the Kingdom of Congo. This reenactment of a 19th century Congo ceremony begins with a contra dance from European royal courts. And quickly segues into much more African rhythms and movements. Afro-Brazilians in the state of Minas Gerais portray the pageantry of the royal courts of the kings and queens of Congo. Delegations come from afar, seeking blessings from Afro-Brazilian Congo kings and queens. In Panama, Congo ceremonies are less formal and more playful, with Congo royals dancing exuberantly to drumming of African origin. Some people characterize Panama's Congo celebrations as a parody of the Spanish monarchy. A more plausible interpretation is that, as elsewhere in the Americas, they represent a continuity of the Congo monarchy. But the African diaspora does not just exist in the Atlantic world of the Americas. It is global. On South Pacific islands that Europeans called Melanesia for the melanin-rich skin of their inhabitants, people whose ancestors settled there thousands of years ago identify with global African diasporan culture. Africans were enslaved on Indian Ocean islands to work on plantations, as in the Americas. Africans were also enslaved across the Mediterranean Sea to Turkey during the Ottoman Empire. Bu insanları bir araya toplamanın, bu insanlarla bir arada konuşmanın, bu insanlarla birçok sorunu paylaşmanın yolunun dernek olduğunu bildiğim için dernek girişimi olarak yola çıktım ve 2006 sonlarında Afrikalılar Kültür Dayanışma ve Yardımlaşma adı altında
Arkadaşlar, 7. Dana Bayramı başlamıştır. Tüm halkımıza Dana Bayramı bir yıl boyunca sağlık, mutluluk ve bol verim vermesini dilerim. Herkesin Dana Bayramı'nı kutlarım. Renklerimiz bir ya. <gülüyor> Renklerimiz bir. Birkaç Onun sebepleri. Karımız e, kaynıyor. Same birine. color. Uh, our blood is, is like same. <gülüyor> All the black people ha. are celebrated and she's saying to anyone. We are coming all together. We are seeing each other, talking and sharing something. So she she's happy about that. <laughs> India offers a variety of African diasporan experiences that contrast with and complement those of the Americas. Some people are come from Sudan, some people are come from Ethiopia. Africa, my father told me that they came from Sudan. Now my father's father's grandfather's they are all from Africa. Now they live here, here we are becoming like Indians now. So many species are in India, in India. We are uh, African Indians. Tens of thousands of Afro-Indians, known as Siddhis, whose ancestors came from East Africa, form distinct communities in several states. Until India's independence, Siddhis were palace guards for the Nizams, the rulers of the princely state of Hyderabad. In Ahmedabad, in Gujarat, the Siddhi Said Mosque, known for its lacy carved stone windows, bears the name of its 16th century creator, who came from Northeast Africa. On Maharashtra's Konkani coast, Siddhis were famous for centuries for controlling maritime traffic from their fort on Janjira Island which is now a national landmark. In Karnataka, Siddhis whose ancestors came from Southeast Africa live in rural areas. We Africans, they were brought here and they were stay. They just spread out in the forest. They celebrated the election of President Barack Obama, whom they consider one of their own people, proudly claiming him as an American Siddi. Wherever they were enslaved, Africans and their descendants resisted bondage. Centuries ago, some of them, referred to as Maroons, escaped to inaccessible places and created autonomous communities. Haiti's citadel is the world's greatest monument 
to the triumph of an enslaved population. Haitians defeated Napoleon's army, the most powerful army in Europe, to free themselves and create the world's first independent black republic and the first government to outlaw slavery. On Mauritius and Reunion Island in the Indian Ocean, people enslaved by the British and French escaped to remote highlands to form free communities in rugged environments. Je pense que le vrai cirque de, de marronnage à la Réunion, c'est quand même le cirque de Bafat. Aujourd'hui, nous dans le site culturel, le paysage culturel du monde. C'est qu'à l'époque, durant l'époque de l'esclavage, durant la période française et britannique, si il y en a à différents moments, un groupe d'esclaves qui s'y sauvait des picots de Banmet pour venir trouver refuge dans la montagne là. Et dans un document historique, et une interview qui nous fait avec Ben Dimoun qui fait nous qui c'est là ce qu'ils appellent la République des Marrons qui s'est installée dans la montagne là. Alors ça, tout ça est bien important parce que c'est le combat des Marrons pour la, affirmer le statut d'être libre et d'être humain, c'est un combat qui est je suis le premier phénomène dans l'île Maurice. Nous considérons ben, nous ben, cette marron comme ben, une précurseur, ben, pionnier dans la lutte pour la liberté. People in Colombia's Palenque de San Basilio celebrate their maroon heritage. El fundador de los palenques, no solamente el palenque San Basilio, sino fue el hombre que, junto a entre 37 y 37 hombres y mujeres que fueron desembarcados allí en la ciudad de Cartagena, huyeron hacia los montes y fundaron el palenque San Basilio. El amor palenquera se caracteriza por ser trabajador, con su palangana a salir para Cartagena o otras ciudades de Colombia o otro país como Venezuela, Ecuador. Soy un hombre de virtud, de lo que Dios me dio. Hay hombre mejor que yo y hay mujer mejor que tú. The marimbula is a version of the Central African instrument called mbira, sansa, and other names. Jamaica honors its freedom-seeking heritage by featuring its national heroine, Maroon leader Queen Nanny, on the bill that people call a nanny. And in the United States, Harriet Tubman led hundreds of people from slavery to freedom along secret paths of the Underground Railroad. Now she has public highways in her name. Spirituality is the realm in which African diasporan communities have best maintained ancestral worldviews and behaviors. In Salvador, capital of Brazil's state of Bahia, African divinities the Orishas of the Yoruba people of Nigeria and Benin in West Africa characterize the city's cultural and spiritual life. In spiritual ceremonies and secular performances such as this one, the Orishas dance cosmic choreographies portraying their roles in nature and human life. Across the Indian Ocean, Afro-descendant communities also venerate spiritual beings of African origin. Baba Gore, the African saint of the Siddhis from Gujarat, comes from Abyssinia or Ethiopia in Northeast Africa. Baba Gore arrived in the village of Ratampur as an agate merchant 800 years ago. Baba Gore also had great spiritual powers and Siddhis built a shrine in his honor. 
As guardians of the shrine, they share Baba Gore's blessings with fellow Siddhis and with other Indians. Baba Gore is now worshipped not only by Siddhis, but also by other Indians of various faiths. Because Iberian Catholics dominated the enslaving of Africans in the Americas, several Afro-descendant communities worship black Catholic saints. Patron saint of Palermo in Sicily, St. Benedict's parents, enslaved in Italy, were from Ethiopia. Como somos de la diáspora africana, entonces queremos conocer también las festividades que cada pueblo o región o territorio del, de esta Suramérica festejan a sus santos negros. In adopting these saints, Africans and their descendants also adapted them to an African understanding of how to celebrate them joyously. Balthazar, also from Northeast Africa, was the African of the three kings who the Bible said took gifts for the birth of Jesus. Es un santo negro, como dice ella, como nosotros, que, eh, que, que nos identifica en realidad porque eh, es un santo que nosotros consideramos que es un santo de los afrodescendientes. No puede ser de otro color, sino como nosotros. En la community chapel, Balthazar carries an incense burner, representing his gift of precious incense. Another segment of the Afro-Paraguayan community called Cambacua their name coming from the Bakamba people of the Republic of Congo, celebrates a different version of the saint. El Santo Negro, como ellos decían, que es San Baltasar, uno de los tres reyes más. Hace milagros. Hay gente que si ya le pidieron y le cumplieron el milagro, por ejemplo, si alguien está enfermo, le, le pide y le, le, hace un, le pide una, un milagro y le cumple una promesa que se recupere esa persona. This Balthazar carries not an incense burner, but a drum, called by the Central African Bantu term kandombe, that also designates the community's music and dance. Le gusta todo lo que es el tambor, el baile, todo eso le gusta. At midnight before Three Kings Day, January 6th, the Kambakwa begin to celebrate their African saint. The Kambakwa also organize an annual festival attended by thousands of people, at which they honor their African saint. Vamos a Canchimaledo, vamos a Canchimaledo. San Martín, con el poder de Dios, el Señor le ha dado el poder y él hace mucho milagro a nuestra, a nuestra raza. Porque hay muchas personas que sí de verdad les ha hecho milagro y la gente por eso cree mucho en él. Vamos a Canchimaledo, vamos a Canchimaledo a buscar a San Martín para celebrar el cumpleaños de él. La... Saint Martin de Porres, the only black saint born in the Americas, is famous in his native Peru for his miraculous healing. 
In river communities in Esmeraldas province, in Peru's neighboring Ecuador, St. Martin also saves people from drowning. The communities organize a river procession to Canchimalero, partying their way to St. Martin's party. ¿Cuál es la mejor balsa? ¿Cuál es la que mejor tiene mejor presentación? Entonces, se, cada, por decir, cada parroquia se encarga de que su balsa sea bonita para que tenga buen éxito. The usual quiet village of Canchimalero explodes when thousands of people converge to celebrate their saint. Que las personas se, se comprometen ¿no? por algo bueno que les haya hecho, por un milagro. Yo había viajado en muchos países en África, bastante. Pero la vida, celebrar con alegría, eso es típicamente africano. Esta manera de vivir con la fiesta, con la alegría, eso es puramente africano, la danza. I'm Sheila Walker, and I'm a cultural anthropologist. My field research with communities of African origin around the world reveals ways in which people, knowledge, and skills from Africa became foundations of new societies. It highlights how African diasporan communities transformed memories of life in Africa to create dynamic cultural forms that continue to enrich global civilization. We round of applause to you, uh, Professor Shada Walker. Would you ask that for her, please? For this brilliant uh, documentary produced by you, uh, Professor Shada Walker is a professor of anthropology and documentary filmmaker, as a director of Afro Diaspora Incorporation. And this is indeed familiar faces on a specter places, a global African diaspora. Thank you very much for this brilliant documentary. We'll now have to move on to the next session, plenary session four, uh, where, but before that, before that, I would want to invite Emerita Professor Shella Walker to give some remarks. Prof, apologies, please. Some remarks about the beautiful familiar faces on expected places in global African diaspora. Prof, can you hear me? So I'm here. Splendid. So um, we have live audience here, and I believe we're also joined by some very special guests online. And what has been the inspiration? Brilliant documentary. What bears the inspiration, please? Well, thank you very much. You, you do hear me, right? Yes, please. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'm a cultural anthropologist, and my issue is the global African diaspora. And I, as a US African American, was told that we had no culture. Obviously, I didn't like that. And so my quest began, uh, came, became, began be, uh, my quest <laughs> became to find this global African diaspora. And I started my findings in Africa and Central Africa. I spent a summer with a wonderful family in Pumban in Cameroon in the Bamoon Kingdom. And that was when I began to understand the relationships between us in the diaspora and people in Africa. All of the specific cultural relationships, the food, the dance, just the way of being. 
And having spent time in Africa, then I needed to get to know the rest of the African diaspora. I began in Brazil. It seemed like the logical place. That's where African culture is most present in the uh, in the Americas. But then I started in Bahia, of course. That's Yoruba, mainly, not exclusively, because nothing is exclusive. What happened in the Americas is that Africans met other Africans. And so there are always Pan-African syntheses in African diasporan communities. Um, but I started in Bahia, then I spread out to other places in Brazil, and from there uh, to the rest of South America. And um, one of the things I found was which, Af some, which African countries are represented where and how they're represented. Um, so we have the, a, a predominance of Yoruba culture in Brazil, but not exclusively. Okay, um, there are, let's see, there, the candomblé is the generic term given to the African religions, but there are different nations. Huh? There's Ketu, Yoruba, but Ketu, the place is in Benin, okay? There are other houses that claim their origins in, in places in Nigeria, but there's also candomblé de Angola, hmm? okay, Angola. Um, if you go uh, north in Brazil, you find the Casa das Minas, Mina. Ghana, right? The uh, what the Portuguese called a coast of Mina, the coast of mines. Um, so, looking through the Americas, you find various elements of Africa. Since I'm talking to folks who are physically located in Ghana at the moment, um, I sh I want to talk a little bit about a con culture. If you go to the Pacific coast of South America, to um, Ecuador and Colombia, for example, you find gold. You find gold miners who are who often have the last name Mina from the Mina coast without knowing what it means, without knowing that that is a reflection of the transfer of technology from Africa to the Americas. And if you find people named Mina, you will probably find Anansi stories. So there's a whole complex of a con culture on the Pacific coast of South America. And if you go to the Pacific coast of South America, particularly Colombia and Ecuador, as I have on a lot of occasions, it's rather surprising. The first time I went there, I thought, where am I? Where in Africa am I? Because there's very little miscegenation. Um, <laughs> and, and so little miscegenation, lots of African names. I mentioned Mina, but there's also Lukumi, Karabali, Congo, Angola. So I think it would be nice if we all had a better sense of where the African diaspora is in the world, you probably don't think about Turkey, probably don't think about India. Um, so if we knew about the African diaspora in the world and how it is manifest, particularly in the Americas, a lot of the creation of the Americas, and when I use that word, I mean from Argentina to Canada, I don't mean the United States. It's part of the Americas. Um, but without Africa, the Americas wouldn't be what they are. I mentioned gold. Gold culture in the Americas is African. And it's essentially acknowledged as such. Huh? Um, after the genocide, essentially, of the indigenous people as a result of European diseases and mistreatment, Europeans brought to the Americas people they call Negros Minas, mining Negros, i.e. people from the Mina coast in Oro Preto, where in Brazil, in the state of Minas Gerais, the center of the, Brazil, uh, the Brazilian um, gold rush, there was a saying that having Negros Minas in the gold mine brought that said in the film, a luck, <laughs> an almost magical luck for finding gold, luck or expertise. Europeans knew which Africans knew which technologies and they forcefully recruited these Africans based on that. So having been in various places in the diaspora, having seen how resistance was manifest in Haiti, how resistance was manifest on Reunion Island, how resistance was manifest on the island of Mauritius, for example, um, I just wanted to put this all together to show us. And this is a very, this is, these are all my images. These are all from places I went. Um, I had not been a filmmaker, but I had all these images that I thought I would just put together and tell a story. And I see this as kind of global African diaspora 101. All of these stories need further development so that we will know 
who, where we are, who we are in the world. I think that's important. So that was my inspiration, simply put. Splendid, splendid. This is Brett Ticket. Put your hands together for her, please. <laughs> and I would, I wouldn't want to be the only one uh, sharing the thoughts. I would also give the microphone to a couple of people who are here to say some words about what you saw. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, uh, Africa is uh, rich and uh, diverse because uh, ever since we started seeing the uh, the film, I mean, it showed us all the places where she moved to, and uh, how also. I learned that um, there's adoption and adaptation. So it's no longer purely the African culture uh, uh, that we know from, the, uh, but it's blended now because when they moved to other areas, they now found uh, certain cultures there and cultural practices, which they now also took to blend with what they came from. Uh, came with uh, from Africa. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Fowler. Let us know. So, um, for our uh, participant joining online, you can just put your hands up, and then we'll call for your mic to be unmuted, and then you can share your view as well. So, live participants, yeah, comments. Yes, Excellency. Um, hello, Sheila. It's Abana. <laughs> I I just want to thank you once again, and this is a, this is a wonderful companion to your to your first film, and I just want to appreciate your knitting together the different stories to give us a sense of how and where how far we were all scattered. So I just want to say thank you. Wow, you're very welcome. I love that comment. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, uh, Mrs. Sheila Walker. Well, you don't know me. My name is Mr. Diallo Abdurrahman. I'm the UNESCO representative in Ghana. Uh, well, I learned from the I learned from the literature, and I know when you were working uh, and still working for the slave route a project with uh, the coordinator Musa Ali Ye, who retired now. So just to recognize uh, the excellent work you you did and uh, and hope that you're still well in the in the in the conversation, you know. But because this program suffered a little bit in uh, UNESCO, uh, suffer from funding and uh, support from suffers from uh, well political support actually. And uh, just to update you, I'm sure you're aware that the program, uh, they changed the name. Now it's no more the Slave Root Program, it's the Enslaved Root Program. And uh, as we will celebrate in two years time, we'll celebrate the 30 years of that program. Well, I'm sure there will be um, a revibrance and uh, we'll mobilize. Uh, you, you, you can stay assured that from Ghana, we are mobilizing, we are getting mobilizing and uh, uh, so that, uh, well, maybe Ghana take the lead uh, again in West Africa to revamp the, uh, the project. So thank you, thank you again for your contribution uh, to this major project and this, this major platform of sharing of knowledge uh, uh, under UNESCO species. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Mr. Diallo. First of all, I am so glad that the name of the project was changed. I was on the International Scientific Committee and I protested from the beginning about calling people slaves as opposed to enslaved people. Obviously I didn't win, but maybe my, my worldview finally caught up <laughs> with the slavery project. So yes, it has. I have had good experiences with um, the slavery project. And some of my experiences in the diaspora were, ex were specifically a result of being a part of that. Um, and Excellency <laughs> Abinabusia, I loved hearing you earlier talk about our forgetting, our own cultures. I, and I wanna talk about the African syncretism, the synergy. So when two and two make seven as opposed to four that happened in the Americas, there's, 
Euro, Euro oriented, let's say that um, researchers have talked about syncretism. So Catholicism and Afro-Brazilian culture, for example. I'm much more interested in what happened first, which was African-African synergy when Africans from West Africa met Africans from Central Africa, and they created new cultures. And I went to a space in, um, this, in the state of Minas Gerais in uh, the capital, Belo Horizonte, and this was a Mozambique kingdom. They have a lot of kingdoms <laughs> in Brazil. And um, actually, it was a queendom. That would be a, bit, a more accurate term. But we were greeted by <laughs> the queen of the Mozambique kingdom, who was a Congo queen. We went into the chapel where they, there were African saints, St. Benedict from Palermo in Italy, St. Iphigenia from the Coptic Church of Ethiopia, Nossa Senhora do Aparecida, the black patron saint of Brazil, who's from Aparecida in Brazil. And this is all, these are Afro-Brazilians Afro who've met. The captain sang a song. And I said, what, what language is that song in? It was clearly a Bantu language because I understand those obvious words, you know, quenba and such. Um, when I, so I said, what, what language is that? And he said, oh, I don't know, something like Benguela. So in this little space, okay, <laughs> we have these saints, black saints from different places. We have a language that this man thinks is Benguela, not a language, but a place from which many Africans came to Brazil from Angola. Um, so all of this is part of this African-African synergy. If I think about me, US African-American told I had no African culture, my great grandmother, supposedly an Indian, because when we were denying Africa, we denied African ancestors. And I knew my great grandmother, she could, I mean, she had some native American mixture logically, but her last name was Congo. So I have a bunch of cousins named Congo. In our version of English, a lot of the words are Wolof. My father used to refer to his friends as cats, hip cats, jive cats. And Wolof, creepy cat, means somebody who knows what's going on. In African-American English, a jive cat. <laughs> or No, I'm sorry, a hip cat. They're also jive cats, <laughs> but hip cats know what's going on. So uh, it's been so enriching for me to learn about how Africans met Africans in the Americas, plus all the African technology that came to develop the Americas, without which the Americas wouldn't be the Americas today. So it's not just singing and dancing, it's gold culture, it's agriculture, metallurgy, other kinds of metallurgy. So without knowing Africa in the Americas, you don't know Africa. And of course, we can't know ourselves if we don't know. Africa too. So we all need to know each other to know who we are. So thank you very much for your comments and questions. Ladies and gentlemen, put your hands together, Emerita Prof. Shilla Walker. Put your hands together for her. Thank you, Prof. You're welcome. Thank you so much. Now moving on is day one, plenary session four. And the chairperson for the session is Dr. Moses Kum Dazi, Business Development Consultant, Wolf Masters Group, and we have Ambassador Professor June Suma, first female Secretary General, Association of Caribbean States and Chair of the University of the West Indies Open Campus Council. We have Dr. Nozizwe Glenn Rose King, former Head of Policy for the South African Chamber of Commerce and Industry, and Dr. Uchena Felicia Ugu, Intellectual Property Consultant, University of Ottawa. They will be discussing topic one, consolidating the diaspora policy for Africa and the Caribbean, We'll have next topic, connecting African people's infrastructures and traffic policies. And finally, harnessing the regional and multilateral free trade ag agreements with aims to advance domestic educational capacity and innovation. Advantages of the AFTA private sector bill of rights for enabling the business environment in Africa. So the chair and discussants, if you're ready, we're ready. Thank you. Hello to everyone. Uh, we're really enjoying ourselves. And uh, quickly, I think that uh, I've already been introduced and um, we are dealing with consolidating a diaspora policy for Africa and the Caribbean. And uh, Ambassador Prof. June Suma, first female Secretary General Association of Caribbean State and Chair of the University of the West Indies, 
uh, Open Campus Council will take us on this topic. Uh, if Ambassador is around, will you be kind to proceed, Ambassador Suma? Um, we will be mindful also to stick to the time. We have only 20 minutes. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you very much. Um, can you see my screen because I'm sharing? Yes, yes, we can see. Okay. Your screen. Thank you very much. I want to um, apologize. First, I'll have to turn off my video because we are having some bandwidth problems, but I will turn it back on when I am through with my presentation. Um, did I get you right that I have 20 minutes? Yes, you do. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I would like to start by thanking the organizers, the numerous organizers, for the opportunity to present at this illustrious World Conference on Education and Restitution. I wish you every success in your deliber deliberations over the next three days of conversation. While my contribution today is very um, primary, I contend that the intensified engagements in the 21st century between the continent and especially the English speaking Caribbean can be enhanced with the articulation of an Africa Caribbean diaspora policy. Um, why would I make such a bold statement? For me, it is about seizing the moment. You see from the resistance movements during enslavement to Garveyism, the Pan-Africanists and the Af Rastafarian movements, the deepening of relations has been at the forefront of the engagement between Africa and its global diaspora. And the Caribbean has been constantly raising that banner. No matter the location of the impetus, the expressed desires have been for a connectedness that would lead to the strengthening of an identity, a sense of belonging, integration, and development in all its dimensions. This was made very clear in the declaration of the Global African Diaspora Summit, which speaks to the African family as the foundation of the continent's renaissance. The following year, that's 2013, the Honorable PJ Patterson, a quintessential Caribbean intellectual, reminded us such a relationship would be mutually beneficial and urged us to strengthen our ties. He's clear that the Caribbean region should be the focus of that relationship. There are some important bases for my reasoning. For me, the first one has to be the timing and the fact that most of the Caribbean countries have been independent for between 40 and 70 years. Trinidad and Tobago and Jamaica just recently celebrating these anniversaries. And uh, we and the Caribbean are at the point where I think we are consolidating our consciousness and our identity. And we have the big, important, mature, conversations right now with regard to decolonization, anti-racism, equality, and reparatory justice. And I think that these things have come together on the continent also, and that consolidating cooperation, partnership, and development must be the next steps um, with regard to our engagement. In order to lay the foundation for my arguments, I'll focus on definitions the various conferences and summits that we have held, um, look at the possibility of consolidating an African Caribbean diaspora policy and the way forward. We have heard this morning and, and in many of the speeches about the definition of what is the global African diaspora. And I think that for, for me, the, um, the most important definition comes from the African Union. Um, definitions on African global diaspora have been complicated by definition. And I think that we have to look at who is considered part of that grouping. Consequently, I mean, from the wonderful film we just had there, you can see that we are everywhere. Consequently, efforts have concentrated on traceable national diasporas and how over time they can be part of the transformation of nation states or an entire continent through investment and innovation. 
the structures that have emerged then to support this occurrence have been shaped by the, that philosophy of national um, diasporas, thereby leaving a gap in the relationship with places like the Caribbean, whose connectedness to Africa could benefit from more policy and institutional structures. So we move on then to look at um, what the African Union has said with regard to its sixth region. We know that the Caribbean has been defined within that sixth region of the continent. And um, some of us are calling for another look at what the, the definition is, but only for further refinement. I think there are lots of conversations around that right now. Um, and we know that the sixth region that we are part of the sixth region. And if you didn't believe that, you just saw the film that, um, that speaks to that. And, and we believe that we are, that all of us are willing, all Africans are willing to be part of the citizenship and, nation, and nationality that will contribute to the development of the continent and the building of the African Union. From the beginning of the 20th century, um, a bold group of Pan-Africanists have been making the case for, for the diaspora to be included. And, and as we have grown and moved, we are looking at a diaspora policy that will, that will um, encompass all of the things that we have said in the past. We have consisted of Africans at home and in the diaspora. And we recognize the notion that all African people on the continent and throughout the African diaspora share cultural bonds and a collective goal for liberation and advancement around the world. And that Africa is the homeland for Africans and for the diaspora. The focus on liberation is very important to us because it, was at the, it, it is at the heart of what has made us African in places like the Caribbean. But of course, you would understand that there are some um, challenges with the issue of definition. And um, a lot of the literature speaks to the kind of fuzziness, you know, that exists now with regard to the definitions. And it's influenced by the fact that you see dispersal, the dispersal that we just saw in the last film, that we are all over. So who are we? And how do we define ourselves? You will see that we um, th there's a comparison now in the literature with, about people of African descent and the African diaspora with places like um, the the the, um, the Indian diaspora, the diaspora from Israel, etc., Armenia. When we were, we are the people, the originally displaced people. And one of the things we have to recognize is that diaspora is not something that is static, that it's something that is constantly changing. And in the end, we have to decide who and where we belong and according to what criteria. And is descent the only defining condition for membership within, um, within the diaspora? And for how many generations can we claim it? Um, and after migration, does member, uh, how long does membership last? These are all questions that we see being tackled within the literature now on the diaspora. For me, it is very clear. And um, it's not something that I, I contend with at all. We are people of African descent and we are part of the diaspora. Mm -hmm. But we have had a numerous conferences that have supported my proposal for that, for, for and the call for an Africa Caribbean diaspora policy. And I will go through, through these. Um, we're going to be looking at the African um, Pan African Congresses. We look at the Durban Conference, the Diaspora Conference of 2012. Um, there have been a number of national um, diaspora conferences. And they have uh, um, looked at mainly national diaspora. And we also have the recent Africa CARICOM Summit. And so let us examine them and what they have been saying. In, 2020, in 2001, 
is very clear that we were saying that, um, that we have a group of people called the diaspora that, can, that we need to invest in, that we need to invest in the continent, that we need to look at how we build capacity, how we look at the justice system, how we include and increase public action, how do we involve, the, involve civil society, how do we um, go about educating and increasing the flow of information, et cetera. And that, that, that conference for me set the, um, the, the, the foundation for a lot of the things that would happen in the 21st century with regard to the diaspora. Then we had the diaspora conference of 2012. I'm not going to read all of these things, so I can always share my presentation afterwards. But then we started to, to, to bring it down to specific areas where we looked at development and we looked at economic development and social cooperation. And this conference was, was um, was called for by the African Union. And it was endorsed by heads of government from not only the African Union, but from the Caribbean and from South America. And it was accompanied by a plan of action and follow-up. And we agreed to certain legacy projects. If you look at the conversation um, 10 years later, there is a certain amount of, um, disquiet, a certain amount of, of wanting to see things move ahead. And we, uh, and that is why I'm proposing the policy, because I think that moving ahead with a Caribbean, African Caribbean diaspora policy will set the foundation for a lot of the engagement, the rest of the diaspora. So because the Caribbean is, is ready, I think, and, and will move ahead with such a policy. And then we had the inaugural Africa CARICOM Summit um, last year in September, and the, the anniversary is coming up in a few days time. And it was under the theme, unity across continents and oceans, opportunities for deepening integration. I think that we have reached the point where our integration with all of the things that we have done needs to be um, on display. I think we need to show the rest of the world that because the, 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 the conversation is always around the disunity of Africa and, and, and the African diaspora, I think we need to start showing that, that there is unity in, and, and there's an opportunity for, opportunity for deepening integration. And uh, there were 69 participants in that, in that conference. And it was agreed that the 7th of September every year will now be recognized as Africa CARICOM Day. And it builds a very strong foundation for the, um, the strong political, cultural, and socioeconomic cooperation for all people of African descent. And we have, um, that conference was um, identifying its stressed areas of cooperation. It, it had an implementation structure. And I already mentioned the Africa CARICOM Day. And I think that we can build on these things with a diaspora policy. There has been a certain amount of impatience um, with regard to the lack of progress. And at the, um, in May 2022 this year, um, 10 years after the conference, the Pan-African Congress spoke about some of the things that they wanted to see. For example, discussing the 20 diasporan seats in the EU, which has, have remained unfilled. They um, looking again at the definition of the African diaspora, developing a diaspora communication strategy, outlining a common plan for, for all of us, and looking at some of the issues that were raised by CARICOM and the EU, including reparatory justice, sustainable development goals, gender issues, human rights in general, and particularly the fundamental human rights of African people, the implementation of the UN Durban Declaration and the program of action, which seems to have stalled, and the UN International Decade for People of African Descent. In two years time, this decade will be up. And people are asking, what have we achieved? Should we ask for another decade? 
I mean, these are the kinds of questions and things I think that need to occupy us when we start to look at, at policy development. I mean, furthermore, the, um, the various recent declarations and plans of action should form part of this expression. Moreover, in the aftermath of the new inaugural CARICOM, Africa CARICOM Summit, there's an opportune time for the articulation and documentation of a diaspora policy for the two regions that have been expressing a desire for deeper collaboration and cooperation. Um, regardless of where we are, we have to start looking at coming together and cooperating. And not in one off, not in one off ways. So we may have a year of, um, of return, but how do we continue? What is the continuity and how do we build on these things? Um, not everyone will want to return to their ancestral land. Not we don't all necessarily have one nationality. How do we deal with these things? And we are certainly not identical because we have, I, we have adapted. So there are similarities and differences. How do we involve all of that within the conversation over diaspora policy? I think yet we have all the components, including um, the concern for homeland development, the common concern for the plight of, of, of diaspora members in other parts of the world, and the consciousness and the emotional attachment. I mean, who says it better than Bob Marley? Africa, you're my forefather, cornerstone. Unite for the Africans abroad. Unite for the Africans ayad. You know, the, we have within us that desire, that consciousness, that attachment that I think will be enhanced by such a policy. Uh, I also believe that um, the words of Marcus Garvey for me resonate when he says um, that we are involved in self-identification. That is what he's speaking about, a self-identification. Um, tomorrow we celebrate the day of people of African descent, um, which was proposed by Marcus Garvey since the, the 1920s. You know, and, and we have been working on this for a long time. We want to talk about the development. We want to talk about nation building. That is what the um, a diaspora policy should concentrate on for me and, and how we develop that policy. And the, the consolidation of independence for, for the Caribbean, for African nation states. We must become more active agents in our own destiny. Not all the regions can start, may be able to start at the same time, I believe. But if we start to see things through our own eyes, we can bring in other regions as we develop and, and as we grow that African, that Caribbean African diaspora policy. I have been, I'm rushing through because it's a short time. But I think that the way forward for us and the next steps in the development of that diaspora policy must be the establishment of a working group consisting of the AU, CARICOM secretariat and related bodies. They already have that, but simply to look at areas of cooperation, I think it has to go beyond the areas of cooperation and that we should involve other groups, um, the Pan-African Congress, the CARICOM Reparations Commission and other reparations commissions um, globally. Groups identified by, by both regions, for example, universities. The universities are at the forefront of this dialogue right now. Um, so let us bring them in. And it should not just be inter, uh, it should not just be an intergovernmental exercise. We also have to involve other civil society groups. There are a number of civil society groups that focus specifically on diaspora. Um, we should have a joint agenda. The, the AU CARICOM summit has already identified some of the priorities, but I still think that there are some gaps that we need to look at. And I think that we need to, to, um, to broaden the, the priorities that we have. 
Um, we also have to make that diaspora policy a living document. It cannot be something that is set in time. So we develop one over the next two years. How do we, what do we put in place to make sure that it's something that evolves and will involve other people and other diaspora world groups as we grow? So, the, so for me, um, the, the policy is, will be the foundation for ensuring that there's a growing African diaspora policy for the entire diaspora. And we need to set timeframes and provide updates to citizens. We have a way I, in, in, in the Caribbean of doing these intergovernmental things and people don't know. And so we will ask a question and then you will say, but you should know this, but we have not told them. And we need to then celebrate Africa CARICOM Day on the 7th of September. This year we are not having a conference, but each Caribbean country has undertaken to have a, its own national celebration of Africa CARICOM D. Finally, I submit that the African diaspora policy, that, that this diaspora policy can form the basis for deepening relations with the rest of the Caribbean and other regions of peoples of African origin living outside the continent, irrespective of their citizenship and nationality as, as defined by the African Union. And I think that this will give substance and form to the sixth region that seems to be still ambivalent. I thank you. Much. Thank you so much, Ambassador Suma. I think uh, you would uh, hang on for a few questions after uh, our other speakers for this session are done with their presentation. But I think that you said something that is very underlining um, Africa and Africans in diaspora integration must be in display, must be in display. I believe you've said a lot of things that many would like to ask questions for more clarity, uh, the challenges of definition conferences, the, 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 the Durban 2021 in Ghana here. Uh, in Ghana, there is the year of return. In Ghana, there is the year of return and uh, subsequent development that has taken place. And you also said something that was very profound that not many Africans in diaspora want to return back to Africa. These are key, important and underlining because this seems very conflicting and it, it doesn't uh, uh, really help to, uh, uh, it doesn't help in the question as to uh, what our African leaders want to build. So I believe that people have many questions that they will ask you. I believe that uh, 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 before you leave, I will quickly go to um, Dr. Nozizwe Glen Rose King, former head of policy for the South African Chamber of Commerce and Industry. She'll be taking us on the topic connecting African people's infrastructures and traffic policies. Dr. Noziziwe, if you are run kindly, uh, proceed with your presentation. Thank you. Please unmute yourself. Okay, it looks like I'm yes. speaking to myself. I didn't unmute my mic there. Yes. Thank you so much for the opportunity and for such a wonderful conference that is connecting us both remotely and the people that were able to participate and to attend physically. And yes, indeed, it's about time that um, as Africans, we look at more practical ways of connecting and um, we need to look into policy reforms that are actually making us to be able to connect with ease. And um, connecting African people infrastructure and traffic policies are not going to give a full clarity and picture without us looking into roads and highways because they are key aspects of connecting people and are therefore critical to economic development. And the ease of communication and connecting people can be attained through effective traffic control. And um, 
I'm going to be focusing a lot on policy reforms that are speaking on traffic control. And um, I would like to actually share my presentation and show you as I continue with the presentation, if you can see the screen, please confirm that you can see my presentation. Are you able to see the screen? Not yet. Okay, um, can you see the screen now? Um, not, not yet. Okay, I'm going to share a number of documents as we continue. So I will start with the first one. Can you see the screen now? I think you can now see the screen. Um, okay, so I will just quickly give a definition of the um, traffic control as the movement of people, goods and traffic between separate points. And therefore policymakers meet within Africa, the, the entire continent of Africa, ensure that the objective of traffic control attempts to make movements and efforts to connect people to be as safe and as efficient as possible. And um, with that in mind, making sure that you know, we attain a zero or minimal damage to the environment as well. So, when we continue, I would, I would want us to have this definition at the back of our minds. And um, our reforms need to look into four specific aspects. First, firstly, time of traffic elements. Which actually talks about the management of traffic congestion and free flow of traffic that result in shorter journeys um, for efficiency. Safety rule of road that come for enforcement of mandatory national and global standards of traffic and connect, connecting people. We are currently referring to a whole lot of the British and the, um, the Western way of policy reforms. And therefore, as Pan-Africans, we need to look into how our roads, how our travel and how our way of doing business needs to actually be challenged by new policies and enforcement of mandatory traffic and connecting people and making sure that there is efficient control of enabling is access to both urban and also the rural. And as a result, then we need to look into partners that need to play a role in this aspect. Firstly, government departments that are in the scope of public work and um, critical infrastructure like town planners should ensure that critical infrastructure policies that consider a holistic and a hybrid system of approach that is inclusive. And when I'm saying inclusive, I'm covering for air, for road, and also for sea traffic reforms that contribute to the ease of movement within and beyond the African continent. And um, I've actually identified, I think about seven or eight strategies and objectives that our policy reforms need to focus on. Firstly, to minimize current capacity and maintain and develop the road network, to improve on road traffic safety, enhancing road traffic disciplines, protecting the capital of investment um, in the road system, and enhancing administrative and economic order in the field of traffic and transport. 
and also thirdly to up, rather fourthly to op op optimize road transport law enforcement and um, make sure that you know we implement efficient and integrated coordinated traffic measurement systems involving the role players in all functional areas of traffic management. So what's currently been happening is we continue to see transport connecting people for business within the continent, within our communities. And we've already seen infrastructures that are actually starting to now break down and need maintenance. And as a result, then when we speak of um, optimizing current capacity and maintaining and developing the road network, we need to look into town planning. We need to incorporate business uh, public works, and we need to make sure that all stakeholders are contributing for the effective maintenance of roads, safety of roads, and making sure that people are traveling within the required time of actually doing business. And then to enhance the quality, productivity, and cost effectiveness of road freight transport services, by providing transport customers with a safe, secure, and a reliable and cost-effective system. Another objective is to advance human industry through creation and growth of entrepreneurial opportunities, training, and skills development. So our policy reforms need to actually incorporate an element of doing business. How long does it take to actually travel from one place to another? How do we create job opportunities within our own um, um, communities where people will be responsible in the management and the maintenance of roads and infrastructures and look at training and development skills for people within our own communities that would be responsible for the maintenance and also taking care of critical infrastructure that helps put the connection of people to be um, much easier. And also to promote a seamless integration and harmonize the standards of neighboring member states such that you know, there is no challenge for us to be able to move from one place to another, remove all the red tapes that are actually causing people to be able to connect from one city to another with ease, look at um, policies that are actually causing delays with regards to applying for trade passports, trade licenses, and make it easier for people to be able to, to travel and to trade within the continent and also to actively promote the movement of the appropriate type of freight from rail and also from um, sea and also um, with uh, our local public transportation as well. So all these policy reforms need to involve town play, planner, planners to share their skills within the communities to train people on basic road marks, for instance, road marks that would make it easy for people to demarcate and to be able to trade without any necessary waste of time or resources. And then I want to look into the infrastructure processes that um, we've de developed within the continents in the past 10 years. And amongst the processes that have already been developed on issues relating to roads across um, the different there has been a significant improvement in at least about 358 kilometers with infrast in the past, both food users for, for public transport, for use uh,
Hello, are you with us, Dr. Nozizue? Um, apologies for the network interruption. Um, but I think that Doc was making uh, important uh, points, uh, practical ways of connecting and uh, policy reforms and traffic control. We look forward to hearing more and also for her to complete her presentation because I believe that uh, audience online and uh, live uh, are present would want to ask questions. Uh, one of the key areas I would like to hear her elaborate more is on border control and uh, immigration and border control and uh, also uh, elaborating more on uh, how to promote seamless integration and harmonizing standards with neighboring countries in view of the numerous of uh, 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 instabilities and uh, the challenges that over the years it's recorded within the southern sub-region of Africa in terms of relationship with other African countries. Um, I look forward to uh, her sharing more light on that whilst we wait for her, whilst we wait for her. Uh, Ambassador Suma is still with us. If there's any question on her presentation, I would like to give a room for that whilst we wait for, okay, whilst we wait for Dr. Noziziwe, whilst we wait for Dr. Noziziwe, if there's anyone who like to ask a question from Ambassador Suma's presentation kindly online with us via Zoom. Thank you. Thank you, Doc. So I'm here with the live audience in Accra, Ghana, and I wanted to also uh, request that some comments have been made in the chat box so you could kindly uh, read them out to uh, our hearing. As I skim the mic to our live audience to see who has a comment or a question to make. All right. Uh, currently, uh, there isn't much. Um, almost all of them are complimentary uh, submissions and uh, affirming what has already been said. So we'll hello, hello. hear from the live audience. Good evening. Good yes. evening, please carry on, sir. I have a question for the previous uh, presenter. Yes. Yeah, you were talking about uh, um, pan Africanism. Yes. And in trying in trying to define what it means, he said um, it's um. Africa or in Africa. I tend to get confused a bit because I know that uh, there are some countries that are not Af that are blacks, yet not Africans. Are those, are those people part of uh, Pan Africanism? I may wish to know, please. Pan Africanism. Don't, don't be confused. Don't be, don't be confused at all. Pan-Africanism and, and, um, is a, a global movement which started um, with Africans in Africa and other Black people throughout the world. Um, and all of, all of them are rec recognize that the, the, the homeland, Africa, is the, is, the, is the land for all Africans. And that is simply what Pan-Africanism is saying, is that all people on the, on the continent and throughout the African diaspora share certain cultural bonds and a collective goal for liberation and advancement around the world. Um, I, I am not too sure what, what confuses in that. Okay, can I come um, in now? Can I come in? Yes. Yes, of that course. Means, that means... Um, Talking about Jamaica, for instance, Jamaicans from yes. North America. Can you say that the, among the Pan-Africanisms, 
can they will, willingly accept to, to be part of Pan-Africanisms? Um, if you say Pan all Blacks, mm -hmm. if you say all Blacks are members of uh, the institution, Pan-Africanism, are you saying you know. that the people, people of uh, maybe Jamaican can willingly accept to be part of uh, Pan-Africanism? That's my question. No, Pan-Africanism is a movement. So people from Jamaica, people, are Af people in the diaspora, people of African descent, they don't necessarily have to be um, Pan-Africanists. Pan-Africanists um, um, follow a certain philosophy. So you don't have to be a Pan-Africanist. And many, many Caribbean people, it's like a, a part of the Rastafarian movement. Pan-Africanism is a movement. But not all Black people are part of that grouping, of that subset. But all of us are people in the African diaspora. And all of us recognize the homeland as Africa. So Pan-Africanism is a movement. So you don't, just because you are somebody who is of African descent does not mean that you are Pan-Africanist. The same way does not mean that you are a, 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 a Rastafarian. But you belong, you still belong to the African diaspora. You're still a person of African descent. So you don't necessarily have to be a Pan-Africanist. So, so many people don't belong to the movement, many people of African descent, but they cannot deny that they're people of African descent and they, that they belong to the African diaspora. All right. Um, as Dr. Nozizwe, uh, back online with us. Please kindly let us know. Otherwise, we will give room for a few questions to uh, Ambassador Soma if there are more questions. So maybe there may not be questions, there can be comments um, to buttress what she's already presented on earlier. Um, so you can also add your comments to what has been said earlier on. Yes, I would like I would like the audience to tell me whether they think that it's a, a good idea to move forward with something like a, an Africa Caribbean diaspora policy. I did a different diaspora policy has a diaspora of their own diaspora policy based on citizenship. How do you see the evolution? of an Africa-Caribbean diaspora policy. Oh, so, do, you um, think that I, do you think I'm moving ahead of myself by making such a recommendation? Do you think that we should just stick to all of the declarations that we have made and we have not put in place implementing strategies for any of these declarations Maybe we will have one now for what is happening with the, with the AU CARICOM Summit and AU CARICOM Day, um, and maybe that can be the foundation of the policy. Okay, thank you uh, very much. Um, for me, I want to say, uh, I'm Dr. Violet Makuku. We are in the Association of African Universities, and we deal with uh, higher and tertiary education. So I just want to give a practical example of uh, the declarations. There's nothing wrong with our declarations and they are some of the best. When I look at uh, higher and tertiary education, we have had uh, the Arusha Convention of 1981, which is like a recognition of qualifications of each other's institutions which is a very important uh, document. And uh, until 2014, that document had to be renamed the Addis Convention of 2014, but it hasn't lost its value. The contents are still the same, but nobody acted upon them since 1981. And you know, even earlier than that, for the document to be there, it means people had already seen the need earlier than 1981. So for us, um, as uh, I see it, it's no longer a matter of 
today we come up with a document. Tomorrow we come up with another document. Our documents will always um, sing the same song, if I were to say. What is lacking among us is the implementation part. How many would agree with me, even on the floor and even online? We have very, very good and excellent documents, but the implementation part is our challenge. And uh, the other part is um, some of these documents are only known by a few. So our machinery for marketing and dissemination is also problematic. Right now, just for interest sake, just ask one or two of the related uh, documents. You find that nobody will give you one. And when you give us one and ask us, how many of you have heard of this document? We will all tell you that we have never heard about that document. So it starts from uh, those documents, their dissemination, and then the implementation strategy. Thank you. So we can continue to have as many declarations as possible. But as long as we do not have the practical uh, steps in place, I don't think we will achieve. Thank you. All right. Th thank, thank, thank you, you so much, much Mr. Moderator. Uh, because of our time, we have to move on. Ambassador Juzuma, thank you so much for your time. It's been a thank wonderful you. having you and uh, other contribution. We're quickly going to uh, uh, Dr. Hello, doc. uh, there's Ron. a hand up. Um, a hand up if we could kindly um, allow Cecile Johnson to just do a quick one before we move on. By your kind. You can unmute yourself, Cecilia. Thank you. Yeah, good, good, good evening, everyone. Um, can you hear me? Yes, please. We can hear okay. you. Um, I, I want to say that the, thank you so much for this conference and the two speakers who just spoke. Um, I have attended a conference in South Africa in 2012, and I, I'm amazed at the lack of follow through. I think what the lady who just spoke said is so true. Um, we are excellent at creating documentation. Um, however, we don't disseminate this information. And um, what is missing here is funding. Funding must be founded to implement these things. So um, to Ms. Uh, Juma, uh, who's asking, how do we go forward? Um, that's be found. Um, funding must be found to you know, disperse all of this, to bring the people together. Um, other places that are serious about this, find funding to do this. So that's where we have lacked the follow through. We have lacked the follow through. So with some of the big foundations out there with all these issues that are coming up about us with our um, global standing increasing, um, you know, and just an exciting time for us as African people, it's time for us to fundraise to get the work completed. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Cecil Johnson. Uh, we'll move on quickly to Dr. Uche Nafelicia Ogu, Intellectual Property Consultant, University of Ottawa. And she'll be doing her presentation on um, harnessing the regional and multi multilateral free trade agreement regimes to advance domestic educational capacity and innovation, advantages of the after private sector bill of rights for enabling the business environment in Africa. Dr. Uchina, if you are around, kindly uh, proceed with your presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me? Yes, Dr. Uchina. All right. Um, my anal analysis will be focusing more on the future than in the past because we're talking about harnessing the regional and multilateral free trade agreements to advance educational capacity and innovation, the advantages of the African continental free trade agreement. Um, 
To provide some background, while Africa has vastly increased its educational capacity and skills, there have been increases in literacy levels and um, tertiary educational institutions and all of that. Yet, there's still statistics still indicate that the continent lacks skilled workers and funding, just as mentioned by the last person who asked the question, for educational institutions and research in comparison to other continents. Also, in the case of innovations, we are coming short in comparison to other continents. Apart from that, we, though there's um, African countries have established a right to education and intellectual property, these rights have not resulted into, I would say, significant changes in the labor. Um, as stated by Mr. Kwarty, uh, the opening of the EU African Business Forum, he says that our institutions are churning out thousands of graduates every year, but these graduates cannot find jobs because the educational systems are traditionally focused on preparing graduates for white collar jobs with little regard to the demands of the private sector for innovation or entrepreneurship. But basically you have a lot of graduates coming out, a lot of money being put into educational grants and the rest, but it seems there's a disconnect between the private sector and the public sector. What can we do to change that? That is, it indicates a strong need to revamp the educational system in uh, African countries because they're not succeeding in the goal of building a strong, skilled, employable workforce that is useful for future economic growth. Um, economists have shown that building up such a I'll say complementary relationship between the private sector and the right, the public right to education is important. It helps determine economic growth. It helps determine how far businesses can go. The fact that Africa is not able to do this at this point in time, it means that we are advocating that in order to achieve the right to learn in a sustainable and effective manner in Africa, it is necessary that the private sector should play a more interventionist role, a more pragmatic or proactive role in developing African educational systems and institutions. That's basically what the Bill of Rights for an Enabling Business Environment under the African Continental Free Trade Agreement vouches for. We're looking at not repeating the mistakes of the past. So I'll just analyze four things, the relationship because people might say, okay, what's the relationship between um, a business environment and the public right to learn? How aren't they two separate things? What's the connection between them? I'll look at also the shortcomings in Africa's educational sector, the causes and issues, and the gaps in previous free trade agreements before, after came in. What are the gaps? Why hasn't it caused the large growth in the number of, and the quality, not just quantity, but quality of graduates that we're getting. And why hadn't it been producing innovations? And then the provisions in the um, Bill of Rights that we hope will be able to reconcile or close these gaps. Regarding the relationship between, oh, oh, let me share this. Can you see the um, access to knowledge document? Can you see anything? Yes, we can see. Okay, so access to knowledge. Basically there's, you could see knowledge as a kind of gap where different people are trying to get in. There are a lot of things there. These free trade agreements, they control technology protection measures, copyright, um, direct messages, access to knowledge, all these things are contained in free trade agreements. Free trade agreements are not just about, oh, okay, I can bring in my property to trade and I will not have to pay taxes a second time, but they also affect the fact of whether 
the farmer who has information regarding a certain variety of plants, if he's not able to um, do something further with it, someone can come from outside, document that information into a certain um, software and sell it. And it becomes, the information does not become the property of the farmer. It becomes the property of the um, networking system, the generators of that system. So those are the kind of issues that we come up with here. I think our audience are struggling with the last document. Uh, if you okay. can, yes, kindly. I think okay, let me close it. Page, uh, page three. Sorry? Page three. Page three. Thank you. Okay. Okay, I'm on page three. Are we together now? Yes, proceed. Okay, thanks, Moses. So the finance, as I said, the challenge is not just about mobilizing more resources for education, but about improving the effectiveness of funding already allocated. So the relationship between these, between pri the private sector and the public sector, I'll say is a complementary one. Because yes, you could say, hey, everyone has a right to learn. Who is going to pay for that learning? How much is it going to cost? For it to be sustainable, if the private sector feels that, hey, what these universities and tech, um, research institutions is doing is going to be beneficial to us, it's going to produce more skilled workers, they will definitely be happy to put in more money to sponsor such stuff. And there will be more innovation as a result of that. So these factors, I'll say, are complementary. Com con contemporary free trade and IP agreements do not only regulate matters such as free trade across all borders, as I said, but they also regulate access to information, the ownership and control of inventions, plant varieties, and other topics that affect educational institutions and innovation. Thus, the public interest in increasing affordable and inclusive access to education to all should be integrated with the private right of doing business. That's basically what the, I would say the ideology behind the Bill of Rights is. What are the shortcomings in Africa's educational sector? Um, I will say, let me start with the deaf. education here. We're talking of the stock of skills, competencies, and other productivity enhancing characteristics that increases the efficiency of each individual worker and helps economies to move upwards the, in the value chain beyond manual tasks or simple production processes. So it determines economic growth, employment, and earnings. Statistics from the UN have identified disparities in educational opportunities and outcomes in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, for Sub-Saharan Africa has the highest rate of educational exclusion, one-fifth of children, between ages six and 11 are still out of school, one third of the youth between ages 12 and 14. And according to UIS data, almost 60% of the youths are not in school. So I will say the main challenges that have been seen is that the educational institutions are too few in comparison to the um, population. The quality of graduates being produced are such that they are just ready for white collar jobs, but they don't have that entrepreneurial a spirit of entrepreneurship or innovation where they can go and stand by themselves and do stuff. Um, they have a lack of ICT tools. These are things that challenges I'll say that have been broadly observed regarding the educational institution and lack of funding has continued to plague the educational regime here in Africa. Why, hey, but Africa has signed so many agreements. Why hasn't it produced the needed changes? Um, in, in my study, I analyzed um, eight free trade agreements made in Africa, apart from the multilateral agreements. These include the COMESA, CENSAD, EAC, ECCAS, ECOWAS, IGAD, SADC, and the AMU agreements. 
these were all analyzed comparatively, looking at what elements do they have that support um, a, an effective environment for business and that support educational advancement. The specific points, shortcomings in these agreements we found was lack of integration between educational and business regulations and objectives. Education is put into human rights. Um, free trade is, is considered as business rights, and these are considered isolated differently from one another, whereas they actually affect. If the business environment is good, there's more money for research, there's more innovation, innovative capacity. If the educational um, area uh, sector is good, it's able to produce more skilled graduates, which actually can attract companies to come over and start investing in the area. But they are not considered together. Most of the agreements put them apart. There's also lack of provision for free movement of labor, especially skilled workers. There are provisions that say, oh, okay, yes, if you if you are an ECOWAS member state, you can travel to so -so -so state without a visa. But we found out that these provisions, even where they exist, they're not implemented. There's lack of institutional capacity and procedures for monitoring um, in implementation. That's a big, I'll say, minus. Yes, they'll say we need to achieve this, but is there, are there specific tools for the monitoring? It's not there. Lack of innovative research and IP protection for local innovations, because some of the things that we take as innovations might be just incremental knowledge. It might not qualify as an innovation under the WTO, but that doesn't mean you cannot protect it from where we are. There's lack of ICT and digital education, lack of connectivity, few databases and peer review mechanisms between African educational institutions and lack of inclusiveness in designing educational curriculums and policies. I found out that where more stakeholders are involved, especially the private sector. You don't say government, oh, you've put this policy, come and analyze it and tell us how well you're doing. But you say, okay, private businesses, come and look at this policy placed by the government, analyze it, tell us if they're doing well. Those are actually more effective in bringing about results than the others. And then lack of results from educational grants and loans and lack of financing for science, technology and engineering maths education. So how does the Bill of Rights help us to solve that? I'll say this is the summary of the advantages of the Bill of Rights for the educational sector. Um, please, could you tell me if you can see the table that I'm just showing now? Yes, we can. Okay. We have these deficiencies that we've mentioned. What's the Bill of Rights going to do differently if you allow it? I've given these other um, helpful institutions and policies just to demonstrate that these Rights or recommendations were given. It's not that they're new, in quotes, totally new. Hello, they Dr. Exist under... Doc, please, can you yes. increase the font size of the table, please? It's by font majority size. request. Yeah, increase uh, beneath the document, you find this Zoom. Um, okay, I should do it on Zoom. No, no, okay. I mean, uh, beneath the Word document, you find. Um, this button to increase, yeah, the percentage no, to increase is, the size a, of the table. There is a plus and a minus button. Yeah. If you could click on the plus button, then it will zoom the document. Oh, yes. okay. I see what yes. you're saying. Okay. It's yes. a little, yes. Yeah. Okay. The right bottom, yeah, bottom yes. of the table. Yes, thank you. Okay. Yes. Uh, you yeah, can so adjust you can it the to the screen. screen uh, so thank you. I'll do yes. adjust it to fit the screen. Print layout. Is that better or is it worse? Um, it's, yes. it's wor yeah, then you it's, can use the, the plus button. Okay. To increase the font. Yes. Yeah. Is that okay? You could use the plus button a little Actually more. send the document to everyone a little bit earlier. Is that okay? 
Yes, yes. Okay. Oh boy. <laughs> Sorry about this. It's proving too trickier than I thought. Uh, let me see. Let me go with this. Can That's perfect. This? Okay. That's perfect. Right. So going ahead, as I said, these provision, provisions exist in various fragmented agreements that allow for these flexibilities, but they are fragmented. They're not together. They're in the, maybe some will be by the countries in Eastern Africa, some by the countries in the West. So that lack of, I'll say, connectivity is one big, is the main, I'll say, gap that I found with these agreements. Another part that problem that exists with um, these provisions, many of them are declaratory. They'll just declare and say countries should try and, or businesses should try and support education, which doesn't mean anything. There's no teeth to bite. There's no, there are no repercussions if you don't implement it. And there's no body put in place to say, okay, if this doesn't happen, you could take the country to court and say, why didn't you do this? And see it as an obligatory right that can be enforced. Sorry, I'm a lawyer, so that might explain why I'm using this type of terminology. So back to the recommendations, we've seen the gaps. What are the things that the Bill of Rights will help to do? It will basically do two things. First of all, it will, instead of focusing mainly on the government, as being the source and the controller and the implement, implementer of this dual relationship. It says, no, the private sector can play an active part in the public sector and vice versa in realizing the right to education. And also on the other side, it also says that um, it doesn't see it as a confrontational relationship, but as a complementary one. Revamping educational institutions with special focus on STEM and ICT skills. Um, first of all, these are the recommendations. A, a functionalist approach for integrating trade. What's a functionalist approach? It simply says that, no, we're not saying that you have this as a right. Yes, you have the right to business, but it is based, it is given to you to achieve a certain purpose. This is backed up by provisions such as the Article 7 and 8 of the um, WTO TRIPS agreement and other agreements which WTO, um, African countries are signed up to. Based on this approach, you don't just say, okay, you have the right to business and you do what you want, but you have to say, you have this right to business. What socioeconomic effects is it bringing about? If it's not bringing about the socioeconomic effects desired, then we have to revamp or we have a right to reshape the way this right is being exercised. We've given provisions for free movement of labor within Africa, especially for skilled labor. Provisions are given within the Bill of Rights for connecting research institutions directly within industries. Um, Public-private partnerships is what we put in place there to say that these have to be put in place so that it's not just people producing research based on their ideas, but research that is actually relevant to the businesses that need it. Special and differential treatment for education and research institutes and the informal sector innovation is also important because at the early stages, even with the BRICS economies, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, we we'll find that you protect your infant industries. Your industries are not as strong as the others. At those early stages, they need special differential treatment. They don't have to adopt the standards of Microsoft and other world institutions till they grow to a certain level. Under the, BRIC, um, the Bill of Rights, we've established uh, African data banks and harmonization of rules so that if a rule applies here, you don't have to go to the East and say, oh, what is under this regional agreement? But by harmonization, I want to emphasize, I don't mean that everybody's rules will be the same. One size does not fit all. It doesn't fit all. Every rule has to be contextualized, but there should be at least some measure of, I'll say, a minimum level at which everybody is able to operate at the same level. We require local content in production and local capacity building um, with labor. With that, for example, if a country, if, if you want to come and establish a business here, we're saying, no, you've got to make sure that 
it actually enriches the workers in that area so that when you leave, they can continue with that business even without you. They can continue building the railways even when you're not there. Documenting and protecting traditional knowledge, genetic resources and informal trade is another provision we've made within the Bill of Rights, because as I said, these are not actually formally provided for under formal IPRs, but they affect whether you can have access to stuff, even online. It affects whether the African farmer can own the banana plant variety that he gave to a certain researcher or not. But we're saying these things have to be protected. I've mentioned public-private partnerships as well. And we've also mandated private sector participation in formulating and implementing educational curriculum and policies. So it's not just about who are the all sector holders, who are the vital people who need to be there. We believe the private sector needs to participate. Education is not just a lone ranger. Intellectual property technology transfer and um, local adaptation, I think I've mentioned that. Yes, results-based finance is also a condition. You don't just grant educational grants and say, okay, you need to, we should say that, okay, if your graduates are able to produce this or able to produce that, then we grant you this amount of money. Let it be linked to results. Within the Bill of Rights, there are provisions for enhancing inter-institutional linkages and position of the educational institutions on global value chain and the right to benefit from scientific progress, open access, and benefit sharing provisions. So in a nutshell, the Bill of Rights will have the advantage of bringing together these provisions that are currently contained in many different laws that are overlapping and unclear. Some of them are treaties, some are soft laws, some are declarations that don't place obligations on countries. So the Bill of Rights is bringing them together in one document saying, hey, you can come and benefit from these rights just by adopting this one document. I think this ability to bring things together in one document, or I will say in one forum, in, in a one stop place where you can say, okay, these will be, I don't have to keep going to different regions to find out what my rights are. I think that helps it to close the gaps in different multilateral and regional um, agreements. It helps overcome this fragmentation. And as the overarching agreement, the Bill of Rights will help to harmonize differences between various regional free trade agreements. It, will, it proposes increased participation by the private sector in designing, monitoring, and implementation of regulations rather than just depending on national government. This preemptive approach is important for increasing sustainable funding for African research and educational institutions. Thus, we urge all participants to push for the adoption of the Bill of Rights as a tool for making Africa's regional and multilateral multilateral free trade agreements effective in advancing national innovation ca capacity in the continent. This will ensure that the after agreement does not end up repeating the mistakes observed in previous free trade agreements in relation to the educational sector. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Uche. That was an excellent presentation and many take homes that uh, we can really look into. For me, uh, I think that lack of inclusiveness in designing educational curriculum or policy, I mean, this is very profound and underlining. And I think that is exactly what uh, Her Excellency Professor Abena Buzia also said earlier, purposeful education for Africa, 21st century, employability skills. Many graduates, they graduate and end up having nothing in the system for them to apply their skills to. Uh, that is a powerful delivery. Let me quickly go on uh, to our Zoom. Uh, someone is asking if your 
Someone is asking if, uh, please ask uh, Dr. Ugo if this paper is available to the audience for the later reading. I just, reading and I if just it shared it. I don't shared. know if you see it. Um, All right. I just shared it. My All list right. is you, you. Did you see it? Um, yes. Okay. So I think that it will be uh, Mr. Moderator will address. You can make it available to everyone, the paper. Yes, I'm prepared specifically for this Yes. Uh, if there is any question from the audience or on the Zoom platform, please kindly uh, proceed. Thank you. If there is anyone with a question. Yeah, so she can't see it. Um, how do we get it across to people? Is there anyone who would like to ask Dr. Uchin? Uh, Ugu a question based on her presentation, based on her presentation. Otherwise, we'd like to thank every one of you, uh, Mr. Moderator, I would like to thank uh, um, Ambassador Suma, I would like to thank um, Dr. Nozizi Wei, it's unfortunate network was a bit interrupting. I also like to thank uh, Dr for the presentation. And so in wrapping it up, we are saying that uh, 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 as uh, Ambassador uh, uh, Suma said, the sister region constitute of the Africans in diaspora. And so the AU is looking forward to focus and reaching out to the sister region of the African continent. We've also heard from uh, Dr. Noziziwe practical ways of connecting Africans and the uh, policy reforms on traffic control. And finally, we've heard from Dr. Uchena and uh, he just, she just confirmed the lack of inclusiveness in designing educational curriculum. And most importantly, African youths want to see implementations of these rights of bills, these agreements so that we can really have something to work on. So thank you everyone and uh, I'll hand over to you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you very much, Dr. Moses Kumdazi, uh, for your very succinct chairmanship on this session. And this is gentlemen who are here and online. Thank you very much. You can put your hands together for yourselves. You've exercised so much patience and focus and attention, uh, and your involvement has been overwhelming. Now, at this moment, um, we we'll want to close down and say that tomorrow's session will be equally action-packed where we're looking at rethinking education excellence in Africa and many more. So I wouldn't miss words. I would say a big thank you to you all as you make your way to take a good rest and see you tomorrow here fully energized to continue the World Conference on Education and Restitution. God be with you all. My name is Ajumar Shudako. This is AAU um, in collaboration with UNESCO and POW. Have a nice evening and bye. Thank you very much. And we, we, um, we would be having a photograph with you on Zoom. So you Thank were able to much. have the physical one. So please don't go, don't go and leave, don't go. Um, participants on Zoom, kindly put on your camera for a snapshot for record's sake. Um, since you're not part of us here, do 